John, this is Scott Walter. Hey, Scott, how are you? Well, not that great. I just came from the site, and uh, the government won't let me in. It's bullshit. Interesting. Well, I'd be happy to show you the uh, videos from Track Rock that I shot last year. Well, I'd love to see it. I mean, that's the next best thing, but God, I'm heading back to Minneapolis right now. Could you meet me in my lab and bring the footage? Absolutely. All right, let's plan on meeting tomorrow. I'll see you then. The history that we were all taught growing up is wrong. My name is Scott Walter, and I'm a forensic geologist. There's a hidden history in this country that nobody knows about. There are pyramids here, chambers, tombs, inscriptions. They're all over this country. We're going to investigate these artifacts and sites, and we're going to get to the truth. Sometimes history isn't what we've been told. to see this video oh, here. Oh, I'm glad to show it to you. Yeah. Say, you know, I got to tell you, the government wouldn't let me in. How the hell did you get in and take these these videos? Well, I, I had a permit back in 2011 and uh, spent a day at this site. It's a huge site. Well, I got clips of a number of rock walls that uh, form terraces going up this mountain slope. Maybe over 100 of these. They're just all over the place. Now, you said over 100? Yeah. It's really? amazing. You know, you walk along, all of a sudden, there's a rock wall and then a relatively flat area. Now, this is a shot from up at the upper elevation. See how nicely yeah. constructed that wall is? Mm -hmm. And then there were some water features, some of these uh, dams that were... Reservoirs or something? Yeah, to control water. Really? And there were some uh, rock cairns up there, uh, some type of ceremonial uh, structures. And, and I even found a, um, a rectangular stone foundation. For a structure of some type? Pyramids, perhaps? Yeah, OK. Yeah. So we have rock formations, extensive terraces to control water, and stone foundations. Is it big? You could get lost up there. The only direction that you would know to get out is to go Let's down. Go down. Okay. I tell you, if you want to know more about this, and, and this is how I found out about the site, you need to contact Richard Thornton. He's a Native American architect down in Georgia, and he spent um, you know, a decade studying this. Does he think there could be a Maya-Georgia connection at this site? Yeah, and that's what caught my attention. I'll tell you what, John, if the Mayans came to Georgia, this could rewrite history. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing good. Scott Walter. Richard Thornton, glad to meet you. Yeah, I was uh, visiting down at Chattahoochee National Forest. Yes. Tried to look at some mound structures. I'm investigating a possible connection between the Mayans and Georgia. And uh, tried to go look at these mounds, and uh, I was denied. You're kidding. No, I was denied. First of all, I take it you support this whole Mayan-Georgia connection? Well, it's, I mean, it's not even a theory, it's a fact. The Mayas are one of the Mexican Native American ethnic groups that became the Creek Indians. What are some of the things that to you provide evidence of this assimilation, really, or this coming together here in Georgia from Mexico? We have the architecture. We have the cultural traditions. The art are very similar. OK. Approximately uh, 
third to a half of the words in the Itsuti Creek language are either Maya or Totonac. OK, linguistics. Linguistics. So what about archaeoastronomy? I mean, like the Mayans use with these amazing structures that align with the sun, the moon, the planets, for practical and religious reasons. Is any of that going on around here? Yes, very much so. That's, okay, so that's what area I'm a spell. I'm a city planner, so yeah, I'm pretty strong in it, so I can help you there. Do you have any of this I have lots of drawings. I have drawings and photographs, yes. Is that what they don't want me to see? I don't know what they do. Why? It's a, it's a massive site. Uh, I want to keep in mind, this place is a half mile square at least. It's a town. Okay. It has over 300 stone structures. It's like nothing else in America, really. It's been radiocarbon dated to at least 1000 AD. What do the archaeologists think about this? I thought the archaeological community would go gaga. You know, they'd be fighting over the chance to be the one to be the great discovery of all their lives. Would you believe that some professors who had never seen this track rock site, they formed a political action group to oppose anything discussion of the track rock site and it being my unit. Now, why? I don't know, because they're like 600 miles away. So you're asking me if I would believe that the academic community might try to shut down investigation like this? Uh, yes, I would. <laughs> okay. look, look, pal, I've lived it, OK? I was hired to investigate an artifact called the Kensington Moonstone. Yes, yes, I've heard of it. When I came out with these results, I was blasted. And it really puzzled me at first, and then it pissed me off. Well, I've spent the last 12 years investigating these historical mysteries. And when you tell me that there's pushback from the professional or the academic community, uh, I'm interested. That, that's a sure sign that there's probably something going on here. These are some of John's videos. You can see the rocks. Mm -hmm. That's a ruin of a building. It looks like an offering altar with a little hole here. I was thinking that also, if this would have been covered with, with clay and then plastered with, with lime stucco. You know, Richard, I have to say, when I look at something like this, I, I'm not impressed. You know, I thought I'd be seeing these cut, beautifully cleaved work stones and these big temples that you think of when you think of people like the Maya. I mean, right. why don't we have that here? This is what most Maya sites look like before the archaeologists go to work and the archaeologists architects like me restore the ruins. That's what they look at, they're just piles of rocks. Even great cities with, that had 100,000 people will be piles of stones in the jungle. What does this site look like? Can you give me a visual? This uh, is a computer virtual reality model. Obviously, there's some elevation here. It'd be nice to see some topographic lines, maybe yes. a topo map. Of well, now, I have topo maps on my computer. OK, I was going to This, ask this is a 3D model, but if you'd like to see the actual elevations. I would like to see that. Do you see the acropolis? You see that? Yeah. You see yeah. that's terraced just like the five-sided mound? Oh, this and is... it's facing the sunset of the winter solstice. These astronomically aligned structures, the whole village, the way they're oriented, is very important. There are many monuments, perhaps 50 stone cairns, that seem to be markers having to do with astronomy. So what is this? That's one of the things when I knew is it's a Maya. When I saw that, I said, oh my gosh. Actually, well, I said some other that? things, but I can't tell you. <laughs> it is a it device is. that takes the water yeah. from the spring and to drop the water to the appropriate terrace. It's a control device oh, for distributing okay. water. What I'm trying to experiment with here is why did they do it? Why did they build the terraces? I am mimicking the environmental situation at Track Rock Gap. Well, the Maya civilization grew these crops on terraces. So do you think what we have at Track Rock is connected to the Mayan somehow? Yes, there's a direct connection. OK, why would they not let me in to see this? I mean, it's just terracing. It leads me to believe that there's more going on here. Do you, uh, do you think there's a conspiracy maybe going on? There's here? something fishy going on up there. I'm thinking there's something fishy, too. But I'll tell you what, if they won't let me hike in, maybe I'll fly in. Have you ever heard of LIDAR? Yeah, up and around. All right. 
This is a virtual image of the area that we're curious about. The main thing is if there's something here, we're hopeful that your equipment will pick up these terraces. We're investigating the possibility of a Mayan-Georgia connection. Some researchers think that there might be Mayan ruins on this site. And if so, I mean, we're talking about a huge new chapter of American history being opened up. I tried to get to this site, and the government would not let me do it. That's why this was plan B. How does this LIDAR work? Well, what you have in between these two pieces of the system is a laser head and the scanner and a GPS receiver, and they're using time stamps. We're able to create um, a point cloud, which is a set of points accurately mapped and geo-referenced in a few centimeters. Within a few centimeters? Absolutely. It looks like you've set up a grid system, so basically you're just reproducing that grid? We kind of think of it as mowing the lawn when we're up here, because it's <laughs> down and back and we use some overlap to make sure that we don't miss any grass. So hopefully anything that shows like there was a shelf or any anomalies in the, in the bare earth surface will hopefully show up that. That type of scale, we should be able to get some data. Yeah, some stuff may look like it blends into the ground, and some, right. but any kind of irregular features should still stand out. If we're able to use your technology and, and find evidence of some of the things we see here, there could be a Mayan presence here. That would be amazing to find that out. It would be. Here is the initial look at the actual LIDAR data itself, okay. so the points themselves, sure. so you can see the flight lines that we flew right here. And then down here is a profile of the ground, you can see the trees. Okay, and I see the uh, change in topography here. This looks like something interesting. What would that be? A um, bump there? Maybe a, a man-made feature. It looks like it might be one of the features that we're looking for. Okay, possibly a terrace, maybe? Correct. This is preliminary, and so what we will do is we'll we'll take and have to process the data, and that'll okay. probably take okay. a couple weeks to get the, the final data set so that we can verify okay. if that is actually a man-made feature or not. A 3D uh, map, about two weeks, eh? Yep. Great. You know, Jamie, when I started this investigation, I was pretty skeptical. I mean, the notion that the Mayans came to Georgia seemed pretty far-fetched to me. But as I've gone along here, things are starting to look more interesting. If you can generate a 3D map that looks even remotely like this, I tell you what, we could potentially have something that's big. If those features are there, we're definitely going to see them in the data. It'll take two weeks for Aerometric to compile all the LiDAR data which could help prove a Mayan connection to Georgia. If the Mayans did come here, I wonder if it's connected to their prophecy. The Mayan civilization began in 2000 BC and started to collapse around 750 AD when they began to abandon their cities in mass. They had to go somewhere, and this stone nearby could be a clue they came to the US.
Are you Scott? Yes. Gary Daniels, I presume? That's correct. All right. Great weather. A little wet today, but I got to tell you, I think the rock looks better wet than if it was dry. I agree. What makes this rock specifically tied to the Maya-Georgia connection in your mind? Both cultures, the Maya and the Creek Indians, use the exact same symbols to record the exact same event. Well, you know, Gary, I clearly see these spiral symbols here. Um, we got an indentation in the middle. This one has a couple of different rings with an indentation. And then we have these cupules along the top. Um, I know what I think it is, but what do you see? And my first impression was that it, it's a star map. I believe that this records an event which happened in 536 AD, which was a comet impact event. And that would explain why they went through the effort to carve this into this boulder. This was no easy task. No, it wasn't. And I have to say, Gary, that I agree with you. I'm pretty convinced this is a star map as well. It's an interesting connection with the uh, with the impact and the symbols tying the, uh, the creek with the Maya. I think that's plausible, but this might not be the only geologic clue that uh, makes a connection. Tell me what you know about Maya blue. Now, Maya blue was a pigment that the Maya used in their murals, and it lasts a very long time without fading. And I think I understand the reason for that. Uh, Maya blue is a very interesting combination of a clay mineral called palygorskite that they mix with a, uh, an indigo pigment made from an anneal plant. And there's lots of palygorskite in Georgia, but relatively little of it in Mexico. Gary, I think that the Maya blue in Mexico could have been made with the palygorskite clay in Georgia. There are still sites in Mexico where they haven't found the actual source for the Maya blue. So that's definitely a good thing to look into. So we've got the, uh, the, the Maya blue pigment mystery, as well as star maps, both there and in Georgia. That's interesting. And those are not the only connections. It goes much deeper than that. Now check these out. This copper plate was unearthed in North Georgia. What's interesting about this is that almost an identical image as this was found at Chichen Itza in the Yucatan. Wow. This looks like uh, some type of uh, shaman or somebody in the middle of a ritual. Is that a severed head? Yep. And you have this in Chichen Itza as well. Exactly. Wow. Are there any other sites that might uh, tie into what we're looking at here? Absolutely. Just a few hours from here, there's a site called Okmulgee. They found an elite burial that showed cranial deformation, a known technique in the Maya world that they also use on their elites. Cranial deformation is a procedure they did at birth where they placed the, the child on a flattened board, placed another board on his head, which forced the, the skull to grow in a certain shape, which gave them sort of a, a flattened appearance to the forehead. With everything I've seen so far, how come nobody knows about this? People have been writing in the literature, the archaeological literature, about this connection for 150 years, but it has become a taboo subject. I'm continually amazed every time I see something new that is changes history in a profound way, and it gets ignored, swept under the rug, and people that even dare to investigate it get criticized. I've been through that myself. You gotta figure out a way to make it stop. Yeah, they say science changes one death at a time, and I think that's what it's gonna take. You know what? I'm not gonna wait for these people to die. Sorry. I'm gonna get answers. Let's go to Old Hoagie. So how long have you been studying this Maya-Georgia connection? Well, I've been researching the Georgia-Mexico connection wow. for about 10 years, but it was only within the last couple of years that I really stumbled on the Mayan presence in both Florida and Georgia. OK. What do you think of uh, Richard Thornton's research? You know, Mr. Thornton has presented a hypothesis, and that hypothesis needs to be tested. Is the track rock site a Mayan site? You know, I don't know. Could it be? Absolutely, it could be. But we're never going to know that as long as the academics are insisting that it can't be. So instead of sitting in your chair talking about it, actually getting out there and doing something. 
Absolutely. Right. Making proclamations about what it isn't serves no purpose. I agree. <laughs> wow. Man. Take a look at this. This is that mound. It's a spiral mound, isn't it? That's without the vegetation. Well, now I can kind of see it. Can we take a closer look? Let's go. All right. We got mounds in Minnesota, but I haven't seen any this big. Wow. One, two, three, four. Yeah, I see at least one, two, four, three. Four, five levels. Even maybe a f fifth one up there. It's, this is cool as hell. Like, there's a site called Zochi Tecatl in Mexico, and it's the only other place in North America or Central America that has a spiral mound exactly like this, where you follow the spiral to the top. Not only that, it's laid out exactly like the mound site here, with the spiral mound on one end and the square mound on the other. This mound, the Creek Indians said, this is where they perform their snake dance. Mm -hmm. And so they march in procession around the mound until they reach the top for their ceremony. There was also Lake Okeechobee. Now, when the Spanish came to Lake Okeechobee, they found three people living around that lake, the Maya Imi, the Mayaka, and the Maya Yuaki. So three people calling themselves Maya. Maya. Is there also maybe a connection to Miami? Absolutely. This is really incredible. I had no idea that there would be a spiral mound here. We have spiral mounds in Mexico. This Maya-Georgia connection is really starting to come together, and I'm feeling it. Gary, you promised me some archaeoastronomy. I see a beautiful mound structure here with a long doorway that's facing pretty close to due east. According to the Creek Migration legend, the very first structure they built when they arrived here was a mound with a central chamber. The doorway of this earth lodge aligned with the sunrise. There's no question that the Mayans also aligned their temples and their structures according to archaeoastronomy. So is this purely a coincidence? Clearly, there was something going on. This is fascinating. I mean, we've got two large mounds. We've got this one here that has an obvious alignment both to the sun and to the stars. We've got that amazing spiral structure, the cranial deformation. I'm dying to go to Mexico. If I can find some of the things that are here over there, We've got something that's huge. Pleasure. Welcome nice to, to the site of Chichen Itza. Everything you see is archaeological evidence. Everything? Everything. Okay. How big is this site? It's really hard to tell. Uh, the, we don't have a full map of the site. I know it took thousands of people to build sites like Chichen Itza. The Maya Empire was massive, encompassing parts of southern Mexico, Guatemala, Belize, and the Yucatan. Many people think the Mayans died out completely, but they didn't. Even so, something forced them to abandon their major cities beginning around 750 AD and spread throughout the region or beyond to the United States. Oh, wow. You know, from this perspective, it's just like symmetric. It's perfect, the lines are perfect. That's amazing. They were copying the shapes of the mountains. 
So what we're looking at here is really a, a man-made mountain. It was intentionally made to mimic the mountains. I've recently been to a site in North America in the state of Georgia. And one of the things that we did that was amazing, and, and I haven't seen the final results yet, but I saw some preliminary data, was some technology called LIDAR, where basically you fly over an area and it will collect three-dimensional uh, data of the topography of the area. And what we think we see are remnants of man-made structures at the site that are somewhat reminiscent of what we see here. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on the possibility of contact uh, with the Mayans here, possibly with uh, native cultures in what is now the United States. I think it's very possible. Oh, you're saying that flat out. OK, well, you agree with the speculation. If we really understand what the Maya did here, and if we really think there was contact, then what we do is take everything that we learn here and then use that as a guide to look for evidence over there. Yes, yeah, I will agree. You can maybe find a Maya there, or you can find a Georgian down here. So well, this building that we have in front of us is the observatory, and it's been proven by astronomers that it's a structure that aligns to different positions of Venus and positions of the sun. So those small little windows up there, they were used to track these planets, track Venus. You know that this window aligned to this part of the year and this one aligns to this time of the year. But there is a connection between architecture, astronomy, and the calendar. Well, this is part of a science we call archaeoastronomy. Right. The other thing that we believe is that creating a building that has alignment with the planets and the sun, you are creating a link between heaven and earth. So the building is the link between the two. In Georgia, I saw a spiral mound. I also saw a boulder that had spirals carved into it. So the spiral is very important. It crossed Georgia, and it seems to connect over here with the Mayans. So maybe that's another uh, connection or a piece of evidence we can uh, tie together between the two cultures. Yeah, I, th I think it's a very strong element, and I think it's very important for the Maya, too. It's in everything. This is called a nautilus shell. It's the spiral design. We have something here called the Fibonacci sequence. And it's just simply an, uh, a mathematical calculation where you add numbers sequentially, and it will grow exponentially, creating, in this case, a spiral. Many ancient cultures saw this design, figured out the mathematics of it in nature, and then incorporated it into the architecture and into their artwork. Oh, yes. It's very important to go into Maya. Buildings are designed in geometric proportions, and they're pleasing to the eye of the human. We're getting very close to the end of the Mayan calendar, which is December 21st, which ironically happens to be my birthday. So, uh, and many people think this is going to be the end of the world because of the Mayans. We are ending the 12 Baktun. That means we're going to start the 13th Baktun during your birthday, and then we're going to spend 400 years more counting days until we get to the 14th Baktun. It's a marker for a new beginning. If the Mayans were here, it will be the biggest celebration you can think about. There will be offerings, there will be sacrifices, there will be ceremonies, because it's not the end, it's just the beginning of something new. But I think it's really important that the Mayans are getting some attention. I couldn't agree more. I'm looking forward to seeing some of the carvings um, at your site here. And uh, there was something that was found in uh, Georgia. I have seen similar carvings, or at least the, the head of the captive on this side. Yes, I think I can show you something similar at the site. You can tell that the person has some sort of a war instrument in his hand, like this one right here. Mm -hmm. He has also feathers in the back, like he has coming this way. But the most striking part is that there's a little head hanging from his uh, left hand with the spears are. You can see that the head is almost identical to the one he has, maybe a captain, maybe somebody who lost the war. 
Really, everything that you talked about, I see here. This is pretty compelling, is it not? Yeah, yes, I, think I can see a relationship between the two sides. I see a huge piece to a, a big puzzle of many cultures coming to North America prior to Columbus. And I think we can put the Mayans into that puzzle. And it just completely rewrites the history of North America as we know it. Okay, Alfonso, let's talk about what we have so far. We've got the temples here. We've got similar stone structures in Georgia. We've got the linguistic connections. We've got the iconography of the mural that's so fantastic, it's virtually identical. We've got the archaeoastronomy. I tell you, we're starting to build a pretty strong case here. What can you tell me about Maya Blue? Let me show you. This is the sacred cenote of Chichen Itza. It's huge. This is a giant sinkhole. It's just incredible. Well, this is the most special place in Chichen Itza. This is where it gets its name. Chichen means the mouth of the sinkhole. That means a cenote. And not only is it a water place, but it's also a sacred place to bring offerings. What do we know about the bottom? What's on the bottom? They found. Uh, Maya Blue, they found remains of children between 9 and 10. This is crazy. Why would they throw children in here? The belief is that children are the ideal messenger to the rain god. So you, when you want to please the rain god, you use children as offerings, so you sacrifice them. Okay, wow. Geologically, I've read that down at the bottom of this cenote, there is a four meter or about 14 foot thick layer that is heavily laden with Maya blue clay. That represents a lot of material. How would that much Maya blue get, get in the, uh, the bottom? One good possibility will be that the children were painted blue before being thrown into the cenote. The other thing is that we have other types of sacrifices, the sacrifices that we know that happened in Chichen because we have a carving and a painting that shows a person leaning against a trapezoid stone so they can put pressure in the back and they can use a knife and slice the chest open, and pull the heart out, and then offer it to the gods. So they placed them on a rock to arch their body so when they made the incision, it would naturally open, and then they would go in. Oh. You know, I knew that they used the Maya blue in the murals and in some of the artifacts, the vessels and various things, but I, I had no idea that they were using it to paint the people for sacrifice. That's, that's... Yeah, that's what we assume by the amount of Maya blue in the bottom of the cenote. Is there any Maya blue, the original Maya blue, still on site here anywhere? Oh, yes, there's still uh, some that we can, we can see, and there's still some on inside of the building. I think the Maya blue could be the hard link between the Mayans and Georgia. As a geologist, it just might be the scientific proof I've been looking for. This is a good example of Maya blue. You can tell it is around the, the square. Maya blue was used for painting buildings and painting offerings, and sometimes sacrificial victims. My understanding is that the longevity of this material, why it lasts so long, is because it's made of a very special clay called Palagorskite combined with a blue dye or an indigo dye made from anil leaves around here. It resists acids and it's very durable. Now, this type of clay we commonly see in cat litter. It causes clumping. We also see it in anti-diarrhea medicine because it absorbs the toxins. So this clay material is very unique. It creates a, a dye that lasts a very long time. How long has this pigment been sitting on this wall? Well, the dates we have is about 900 AD. That will be about 1,100 years ago. 1,100 years ago. Indeed. So this unique clay, where would they get this source material? I don't know. I haven't found a single source. Yes, and that's another important piece to this puzzle that we're trying to figure out is we do have um, a very good source of palagorskite in Georgia, and this could be the source for the Mayans. 
And I do have a way I think we might be able to test this so we can compare it to see if this is the same source material as, as Georgia found here. I'm getting really excited about this case. We have the cranial deformation. We have evidence in Georgia of that practice. We know we have it here. We have the wonderful mural that you showed us that the iconography that was virtually identical to that copper plate that we talked about. We have stone structures in Georgia that have a similar layout, at least it appears to be a similar layout to what we have here. And lastly, we have archaeoastronomy, which ties all people together, but certainly the culture in Georgia that we're looking at and the Maya people here. We still have the uh, LIDAR data that we need to look at, but I tell you what, this is looking really good. All right, Jamie, show me what you got here. So this is the LiDAR data of the track route site. And so what we're looking at here, this is the side of the mountain that we were flying around with your plane and shooting with the LiDAR. We've taken the trees away. I put markers in here to kind of indicate um, in relationship to the picture that you gave me of the site itself. Are you saying that Richard Thornton's recreation of what he thinks is there correlates with what you found on the, on the LiDAR? In terms of my LiDAR experience, yes. I really? think that there's a very strong indication that this <laughs> correlates very well. You can see it here, here. You can see something here, and then you can see all the little terraces down here. This is amazing. What about the Oak Mogi site? Were you able to fly over there? Yeah, we actually did get oh, down there, and we were able to fly it. Right here, what we're looking at is the actual LiDAR data, so how it's represented. This is the spiral site. I think I can see what looked to be the terraces that we saw at the site. There's no mistaking when you look at that image that it's definitely a mound. The spirals appear to be there, and it looks virtually identical to spiral mounds that are down in Mexico. I tell you what, this is really coming together. I'm just, I can't believe it. I mean, we've got spiral mounds that the Mayans built. We've got them in Georgia. We've got archaeoastronomy, both the Mayans and in Georgia. We've got cultural iconography. We've got cranial deformation. We've got linguistics. It's really coming together. All the pieces are beginning to fit. But there's one more thing that I want to do, a, uh, a quick test that I think might be the final piece that pulls this all together to prove that Mayan-Georgia connection. Hey, Adam, mm -hmm. check this out. What do we have? We're going to make some Maya blue. It's a paint that the Mayans made. It was very sacred to them. They used it in murals. They also used it in sacrifice, ritual sacrifices. Paint the victim head to toe in this Maya blue paint, rip their hearts out, and then throw the body in the huge sinkhole they call the cenote. But I think geology is going to solve the question that we're trying to answer here, which is, did the Mayans use Georgia clay, specifically Palagorskite clay? Okay. Using indigo from anil leaves and Palagorskite clay from Georgia, I'm going to make Maya blue. If the Georgia clay in my sample matches X-ray test results of clay used in real Maya blue, then we have a hard geological link between the Mayans and Georgia. Well, basically what I'm trying to do is to figure out if there's a match between Maya Blue in Mexico and a sample of Palagorskite from Georgia. They did find some sources in Mexico, but there's just not enough sources to explain the amount of Palagorskite that they found. Well, I definitely think we can help you with this, so uh, let's have a look. 
If you're able to make a definitive connection, it will prove to me beyond a shadow of a doubt that we definitely have this connection between the Mayans in Mexico and Georgia. Here we've got the scan that we did. The ones labeled PA are the peaks we would expect for the Paligorskite clay structure. And these ones labeled QU, these are one of the impurities present. And this is the mineral quartz. So these are your signature elements. Now the question is, how did it compare with the actual Maya blue sample? It actually matches almost perfectly. So we have a match, don't we? Yes, we do. <laughs> you know what? I'm surprised, but yet I'm not surprised. Given everything that I've seen, this was the final piece to tie this together. There's a whole host of academics that refuse to believe that there were cultures that came to North America prior to Columbus. And it's bullshit. This is scientific proof of a connection. It's impossible to deny. It's going to make a lot of people very excited. Richard Thornton, uh, one of them, who's a researcher that was adamant that there was absolutely a connection between the Mayans and the people in Georgia. This testing here not only forces us to re-examine this chapter of American history, but it demands that we open up the whole book to get to the truth of what really happened. Mayan prophecy does declare 2012 as a turning point. Maybe not the end, but the start of a new Baktu, a new beginning. A new beginning might have been what the Mayans were looking for in Georgia. Whatever it was, it must have involved archaeoastronomy, some sort of alignment to the stars. There are so many unanswered questions still out there. What I've learned about where they went and what they believe is just the beginning. There's more to America than we realize. We have the right to question the history we've been taught to examine things with our own eyes. My job is to explain the unexplainable, to find the answers to questions about our past when no one else will. history that we were all taught growing up is wrong. My name is Scott Walter, and I'm a forensic geologist. There's a hidden history in this country that nobody knows about. There are pyramids here, chambers, tombs, inscriptions. They're all over this country. We're going to investigate these artifacts and sites, and we're going to get to the truth. Sometimes history isn't what we've been told. Stonehenge in England is one of the most awe-inspiring ancient sites on Earth. Even today, its origin and purpose remain shrouded in mystery. One thing archaeologists know for sure is that its construction took over 2,000 years. 
One thing they don't know is who built it. There's no doubt the site, originally comprised of some 150 stones, was the work of some advanced civilization that knew enough about the sun, moon, and stars to align these stones with the heavens in a very specific way. But what if I told you we have our very own Stonehenge in the United States, and that it's possible the two sites were built by the same people? I'm on my way to investigate it right now. America's Stonehenge is a prehistoric site in Salem, New Hampshire. The owner says the stone structures here date back 4,000 years. I got a call from his son, Kelsey. He's discovered a solar alignment, an example of archaeoastronomy that he wants me to see. So, this is the uh, Central Observatory, and this is what I was telling you about why we call America Stonehenge. Just like at Stonehenge, someone placed standing stones, large vertical rocks, in a circle. The placement is key. When viewed from the center of the site, each standing stone lines up with the sun on important days of the year. The solstices, the longest and shortest days, the equinoxes, when the sun is on a level plane with the Earth's equator, and the cross-quarter days, which fall midway between them. This is the uh, summer solstice sunrise stone. So on summer solstice, the sun basically just rises right over there, right over the stone, just kind of comes out diagonal, and then just kind of tracks across the sky. And then on the sunset, it just comes right over to right over here. summer solstice sunset stone there. You realize this says an awful lot about your site. Whoever was here is marking these important dates of the year, like many ancient cultures all over the world did. I've been seeing this a lot lately. It's called archaeoastronomy. It's how ancient cultures use the sun, moon, stars, and planets in their architecture and design. I saw archaeoastronomy in Georgia where it connected Native Americans to the ancient Mayans. And I saw it in a cave in Oklahoma, where markings that are part of an equinox illumination may have been left by the Celts. The ancient practice of archaeoastronomy seems to tie many highly advanced cultures together, and it also seems to tie them to America. You know, I'm looking at that stone, and it looks very interesting. Is there any chance we could go down and take a look at that closer? Oh, sure. OK. Well, that's pretty interesting. Can you tell me a little bit specifically what happens with our alignment here? Sure, yeah, well, basically what happens is on summer solstice, the sun will rise right about, right about in the middle here and just kind of go at almost like a perpendicular to where, this, where the stone is and just go right across and just kind of rise up, up diagonally. The sky. Well, we think actually originally probably was going to be up here. And, you know, over the course of time, it probably moved. OK, well, if it moved, that's very interesting, because over time, the Earth's axis does shift. Right. You probably remember the earthquake in Japan recently. It was documented that the, uh, the axis of the Earth actually moved about 8 centimeters. Wow. Now, that may not seem like a lot, but over time, over thousands of years, it adds up. Right. So actually, to have the alignment move makes a lot of sense. And that's important because we can actually use that for dating. And so as you know, the Earth's axis shifts, these alignments do shift. And that could indicate a significant length of time. 
Well, you know, we actually had someone come up and check that out. Really? And they, uh, from how far it's moved, they actually dated the site back to about 3,800 years ago. 3,800 years, okay. Well, I tell you what, that's really an important thing because there are many people that think that by using archaeoastronomy, that's actually a more accurate way of dating than carbon-14. So if that's the case, you've got a pretty ancient site here. Clearly, this isn't natural, a <laughs> natural position. This was placed in the ground. It appears to have been quarried. It looks to me like it's actually been worked a little bit, and all the surfaces are definitely weathered, significantly weathered, right. and uh, definitely indicates time. This has been here for, for a long time. Well, you know, also, we call this place America's Stonehenge, obviously, because of the standing stones. But there's another thing that I found that I think really directly ties the site into Stonehenge in England. Really? Yeah. Well, if you've got time, I'd love to see it. Sure, let's go. <laughs> right. Kelsey, let's see what you got here. All right, well, a few months ago, I was on Google Earth, and uh, I was kind of drawing all the lines out on the alignments, just basically to see where they go. As I was drawing one out on the summer solstice sunrise alignment, yeah, I kept taking it out further and further, and uh, you know, I noticed one over Nova Scotia and, and Newfoundland. A north, kind of a northeast direction. Right, okay. yeah. And then um, as I took it over, I also went right over to England. And I thought that was kind of interesting. So I kept zooming in further and further, and it was, what through Stonehenge. What? It's going all the way over towards Stonehenge. Not only does it go just through Stonehenge, it actually goes right through one of the trilithons at Stonehenge. Wait a minute. Through one of the trilithons at Stonehenge? That's right. From America's Stonehenge? Stonehenge is the most well-known megalithic site of all time. It's a sacred site but no one knows who built it or exactly what it was used for. But maybe whoever built it built this too. That's amazing, but I see this line continues off to the east. Where does that go? You're never gonna believe where that goes. Let me get this straight. You're talking about, we're starting at America's Stonehenge in New Hampshire, right. and this summer solstice line extends to Stonehenge in England. It actually goes right through one of the trilithons. That's amazing, but I see this line continues off to the east. Where does that go? You're never gonna believe where that goes. Okay, I'm ready. <laughs> All right. Starts going over towards the Mediterranean. Yeah. You're kidding me. Yep, goes right through Beirut. <sighs> Are you sure that's right? I double checked it. Beirut, Lebanon? Well, that's the ancient home of the Phoenicians. Okay, you realize what this means. Do you think there's a connection here between the Phoenicians and America Stonehenge? I think it's definitely possible. Well, I tell you what, if you've got a connection here, this rewrites a huge chapter of American history. This isn't kidding around. The Phoenicians were based along the coastline of the Mediterranean in modern-day Lebanon. They were an ancient seafaring culture that emerged around 1200 BC. 
They were known for trading with distant lands. Maybe they even made it to America. They're also responsible for inventing the alphabet we use today. So Kelsey, how did your family find out about America's Stonehenge? Well, my grandfather actually heard about it on the radio when he was getting his hair cut back in 1955. <laughs> yeah, afterwards, he went up and checked the site out. Mm -hmm. He was just so intrigued by it, he just, just had to buy it. Oh, well, it wasn't always called America Stonehenge. And there was actually a book uh, written back uh, around 1907. It was referred to as uh, Patty's Caves. Who's Patty? He was one of the first people that was on site and he has lived there for the 1700s and into the 1800s. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, I know you guys think this is an old site, but why couldn't he have built it? Well, I can show you. This is it. This is where Pei's house was. Right in this area right here? Yeah. There's no way that Patty built this. It just reeks of being really old. Yeah. And if it's old, it's important. Some people think that he used the existing stone structures up in that area for animal pens. He built those huge, massive walls for animals when he's got all these trees and he could have used wood. That's, that's what they think. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't buy that one. I mean, look at the size of these rocks. I wouldn't want to move them. <laughs> What's uh, that big slab there? Was that uh, was that like a roof? We think that was most likely a roof slab for a, a chamber right there that okay. collapsed. You know what's interesting about rocks like that? Those actually serve as clocks as well and indicate something about the age of a structure. This has a genuine feel to it, and it's it's. Amazing. I mean, look at all this. We do have one more thing uh, that ties the site into the Phoenicians. It turns out Kelsey's dad has a stone from the site. It has a carving on it, maybe some kind of ancient message. Scott, this is the uh, ball stone. It was oh, found in 1964. What does it say? Well, it says, uh, to ball on behalf of the Canaanites, this is dedicated. Well, the Canaanites from the land of Canaan. That's right. That's what they used to call themselves, but everybody in the region called them the Phoenicians. They got all over the, uh, the known world at that time, and many people believe that they made it over here to uh, North America. And, and there are many examples of possible Phoenician writings all the way from Maine down to Brazil. Well, I tell you what, if this is indeed a Phoenician inscription, you've really got something important here. Absolutely. I mean, together with the alignment that you found, you're talking about an incredible sight, an incredible discovery. And it really just blasts apart the, uh, the history books in places Europeans here in North America mm -hmm. around 3,500 years ago. Before I make any conclusions, I need to make sure this inscription is old and that the lines are man-made, not natural. By using a 3D microscope, I can see how deep the grooves go and if the inscription has been weathering for a long time. What I want to do is I want to focus on this groove right here, which I numbered as number three. Groove number three. And that corresponds to this groove right here. This is about 4,000 microns from the highest point down to the deepest point. This one clearly is a man-made groove. It looks like it here. It looks like it here. I can already tell many of these marks that make up the inscription could be centuries old. And there's no doubt they were deliberately made. Because it references the Canaanites, I have to consider the Phoenicians, but I need to know more. 
Is there anything else here that you might have that possibly could tie this site to the Phoenicians? Well, there is one more thing. It's actually up on the site. Uh, we call it the sacrificial table. Sacrificial table? Yes. Well, I'm not going anywhere until I see that. And this is the sacrificial table. This? Do you think there was really human sacrifices here? And we believe the sacrificial table could have been used for human or animal sacrifice. The stone's about nine feet by six feet. It sits on four legs, it weighs about four and a half tons. And on top is a rectangular shaped groove that's about six feet by four feet. And the table's tilted towards me. So if there was a fluid such as blood on it, it would go into the groove, and then it would continue in the groove towards this little runnel right here. And it would go into possibly a little base. So there is a cutout in the bedrock where a base could sit. Well, I see the, uh, I see the groove, and you think this was for channeling blood. That's amazing. There's something else that I see. And you see all this cracking and, and this layering here along the entire surface. That's uh, what we call exfoliation weathering. It's kind of like when dead skin peels off your body. That's interesting for a couple of reasons. First off, that indicates a lot of weathering has gone on here. This is wetting and drying, freezing and thawing. And there's been a lot of loss of material on the surface, which indicates significant age. And I think this could probably be used as a, a weathering clock. I see significant weathering here that appears to be consistent with the astronomical alignments that we saw with the structures that are here, which indicate that this is a very old place. There's one more secret of the table I'd like to show you. Oh. Hello, it's Scott Walter. What the heck was that? behind the curtain. That's right. <laughs> That's funny stuff. <laughs> so what do we have here? Well, Scott, you're standing in the oracle chamber, and we call it the oracle chamber because of this tube here that goes through the wall about six feet from the oracle chamber where we're standing out to the sacrificial table. And we think during a ceremony, perhaps people watching above would hear this voice coming out, and it would be like a god or a spirit talking to them. And it was probably a priest or shaman actually shouting through the tube. Interesting. So really what we have is an example of uh, archaeoacoustics and science of where the ancients would manipulate sound typically in uh, rituals by using something like this tube here to create uh, a pretty scary sound in, in this case. Can you imagine somebody sitting on that table about to be sacrificed and hear that voice? I mean, it must have been really scary. I can't help myself. Do you mind if I give it a try? Yeah, I guess, Scott. Okay. All right. This is Paul. Get off my lawn. I'm glad I came to investigate this site. I don't know what's more interesting. The sacrificial table, the ball stone, or the summer solstice line that connects America's Stonehenge to the one in England. And further east, to Beirut, Lebanon, home of the ancient Phoenicians. I plan on coming back for the solstice, but right now I'm headed to Mount Holyoke College to talk to an expert on Phoenician culture. Scott Walter. Mark McMenamin. 
Mark, I just uh, came back from a very interesting place um, called America's Stonehenge. One of the things that I saw that was discovered by Kelsey Stone, the son of the owners, was a long-range alignment that starts at their site that goes from their site to Stonehenge in England and then extends to Beirut, Lebanon, which is the ancestral home of the Phoenicians. Who were the Phoenicians? The Phoenicians were a, a group of Middle Eastern people and th their, their center was in modern Lebanon and they developed colonies westward from there the most important of which was Carthage. The Carthaginians were Phoenicians on steroids because <laughs> they were the most powerful Phoenician culture that ever developed. Also, they tended to be very secretive. So it's been a challenge to try to figure out exactly what the Phoenicians knew, what they were able to do, and we're still trying to learn more about them. And it's a, it's a, a, a difficult task because there's not much evidence. The uh, Phoenicians really sort of appear um, around uh, 1200, 1000 BC. They were trying to build trading centers and colonization centers, and they began to move both north and south along the Atlantic coast. Part of the reason for Phoenician success as navigators was the fact that they were able to navigate at night, and this is because mm -hmm. they knew about Polaris, the pole star. Polaris is also known as the North Star. And if the Phoenicians knew about it, chances are they knew about the rest of the sky too. The sun, the stars, the moon, the planets. And that means they would have had enough knowledge of archaeoastronomy to create the summer solstice alignment from America's Stonehenge to Stonehenge in England. This proposed alignment at America's Stonehenge is very intriguing. And there's a possibility that it will connect to some research that I did, in particular, uh, a study that I made of a group of Phoenician coins that had been minted in Carthage in 350 BC and that I interpreted as having a map on the reverse of the coin. Is you right have here. a picture of the coin? Yeah. Yes. This, okay. is, this is a picture of the coin this right is here. This good. Okay, here, here are two images uh, from the British Museum. You can pick out the islands pretty clearly. Sardinia in the center, which is the central point in the Mediterranean basin. And we've got Sicily there, the triangular island, um, the, the boot of Italy coming down, Iberian Peninsula here. Um, this straight line here is probably the, the north coast of Africa, India here, and this is America. And this almost looks to me like they're giving us the Gulf of Mexico there in Florida, but uh, that could be subject to interpretation. Well, that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Couple thoughts here. Sure. They were, they're here, they were put there for a reason, and I guess until a better thesis comes along, I like yours, I love yours, but. Well, well thank you. I, I think that this, this gives us an insight into uh, the Phoenician psyche. Absolutely. Okay. And remember, they're extremely secretive, you know, and so they're not gonna be giving away the store, so to speak. However, there was, they, they had enough ego <laughs> to want to have some kind of record of what they had done, so here, on these coins and these tiny little images, they, they were giving us a, an extremely condensed Phoenician geography, you know, telling a huge story in, a, in, a, in a, a couple of millimeters space here. There's one other thing I'd like to talk about. It's this sacrificial table. Did the Phoenicians practice human sacrifice? Yes, they did. And I think the evidence is overwhelming that, that they uh, they did practice human sacrifice. I think there's a lot of sources, biblical and otherwise, suggesting that this was the case. Do you think the Phoenicians made it to North America or not? They probably went farther than anyone is willing to admit today. They had the ships to do so. I think the Phoenicians could easily have crossed the Atlantic. Their whole history suggests that they would have tried to do this. Diodorus, um, a Greek historian reports that the Phoenicians knew about this gigantic island out in the Atlantic with navigable rivers. The only place with navigable rivers once you get past Spain is America. When I went to America's Stonehenge, I was amazed to learn about a possible connection between that site in New Hampshire and Stonehenge in England. Bob Stone purchased America's Stonehenge in 1955 because he believed this ancient place needed to be preserved. Years later, when
when his grandson Kelsey mapped the site's sunrise solstice line, he discovered that line started at America Stonehenge and went straight to Stonehenge in England. And now I'm heading there to see if these two ancient sites with massive standing stones are connected. So Henry, I'm, uh, I'm here because I'm investigating a uh, megalithic site in New Hampshire called America Stonehenge. And there appears to be a connection to Stonehenge here. And uh, I'd just like to know a little bit about Stonehenge. Well, Stonehenge, I mean, it's, it is one of the most famous prehistoric monuments. But I think uh, a couple of things that people don't always realize about it is that it, it took over a 1,000 years to make what you can see now. To so, construct. Yeah, yeah, there's lots of different phases and it gets reinvented through time. Well, you know, when people think about Stonehenge, they think about what's right here, but you're saying that it goes all around us, even beyond where we are? Yes, yeah, I mean, they get going back for a couple of thousand years before, yeah, you've got various monuments in all sorts of different directions, and the focus over time becomes these, Stonehenge. These yeah. stones. Stonehenge is the most well-known megalithic site in the world. It consists of 150 enormous stones, the tallest of which rises 22 feet from the ground. But in the beginning, around 3100 BC, it was just a hinge, a ditch, a bank, and several round pits. But even then, it was a popular gathering place. Being a geologist, I'm very interested in the rocks, the stones. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about the stones. There's a variation in the geology, is that right? Yeah, there's two different types. The very big stones uh, are sarsen, uh, and those, they come from sort of the local area, you know, okay. within 20 miles or so. All right. The blue stones, which are the smaller ones, they're still very big. Yeah. They come from South Wales. So, yeah. You know, so how, how far away is that? Well, it's about 150 miles, but. If you, if you wow. think, actually, how they would have transported yeah. them, that's not straight. That's a, that's a so, heck of a task. 240 miles, maybe? I mean, that's at the heart of it. That really uh, suggests sophistication and coordination and something at a pretty complicated level. I think there's a huge amount of sophistication. People do know what they're doing. I mean, the fact they can build Stonehenge, the amount of labor which goes into building yeah, something right. like that is incredible. I mean, people have estimated something like 30 million hours or so. Yeah. 30 million just, hours? Just of, of work. And how many yeah. people say to move one uh, of those stones? There's no real way of telling it. something which we continue to sort of think about. But the fact they did it, I mean, it's, it's a massive feat of engineering. But we keep on finding they're more sophisticated than we thought. So it might say 600 people, but it might have been just a couple. The blue stones may not be the biggest stones here, but for me, they're the most interesting. They're said to have spiritual significance, and I think America's Stonehenge has that too. The blue stones came from a land that was believed to have healing powers. Archaeologists think Stonehenge may have been a franchise of sorts, a closer version of a faraway sacred place. There's no doubt these stones were placed here for a reason. And it has everything to do with the sun and the solstice, just like it does at Stonehenge in New Hampshire. If we think back to ancient times, were there rituals going on? What were the people doing at this well, site? We could see ceremonies following on the summer solstice, you know, on the day of the solstice, people starting the day at the eastern pit, as from here you can observe sun rising on the solstice. Right. And then they're following the sun round. So basically, the actual, this long rectangular enclosure is basically just a walkway. So you follow around the perimeter, 
following the sun in front of you all the time, but it's a bit like a church or a cathedral now. You have multiple functions, and I think all of those would be happening here. Why do you think it was so important for these ancient people to track the movements of the celestial bodies? The people are farmers. They rely on seasons. They rely on understanding. They know when to plant crops and when to harvest them. But actually having a sense of how that time develops, I think, is really important. You know, the, the importance of these, these bodies, I think, is fundamental to being human and being farmers, but also it's something which they celebrate. Tell me a little bit about the archaeoastronomy here. Well, there's, there's been, a, again, a huge amount of work. The, you'll see there are some stones dotted around the, the, the site. I which... saw a big one. Well, I can see it right here, that yep. big standing stone over there off to I the mean, side. The, 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 that one is known as a heel stone. Now, the weird thing about that stone is it's undressed. It's un, it hasn't been worked like all the other stones on site. But what seems to be important is that stone. Whenever you look at the centre of Stonehenge and line things up, and people have done this in the past, that's the stone which leads you towards the, um, the, the summer solstice sunrise. If you line up the heel stone with each of those pits, on one side it marks sunrise on the summer solstice, and the other one it marks sunset on the summer solstice. I don't know, is that more than coincidence? That they actually are lining up with two very sort of significant I don't, events? I don't think it's a coincidence, no, I don't. They have something I'd like to show you. It's a new discovery of archaeoastronomy at America's Stonehenge. It's a summer solstice line running from the site in New Hampshire directly to here. My initial reaction would be that that's beyond, beyond possible. When I was at America Stonehenge, a megalithic site in New Hampshire, I learned about a new discovery by the owner's son, a connection between that site and Stonehenge in England. From there, the line extends even further to modern-day Lebanon, which was the home base of the Phoenicians. I want to find out if a Stonehenge expert thinks all three sites could be connected to each other and to that specific ancient culture. So here we have uh, the alignment uh, that starts at America's Stonehenge at the center of the observatory. And then as you extend a line through and continue that line, it comes across the Atlantic and comes right here to Stonehenge. When you look here at a close up, um, you can see that it goes right through that central trilithon. Then, if you extend that line, it goes to Beirut, Lebanon, the home of the Phoenicians. As incredible as it is, it appears to be there. What's your reaction? I think it's incredible. I can't imagine there's a link, other than the possibility that people are marking the same sort of alignment. And I think also, when you extend it onto the, the Phoenician worlds, their world starts around about 1200 BC. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this site's sort of finished, really, by about 2000 BC. So there's a good 800 years or so difference. Interestingly, I think Stonehenge has attracted people in prehistory from quite far, far away. There's, there's a burial just over, over there, actually a couple of burials from over there, one from about 1400 BC. So it, people are moving here. It's feasible that Phoenicians might have been, you okay. know, there's, it's not beyond possibility. Um, but they couldn't have been involved in the design of Stonehenge because it's too early. I don't think there's any question that this site was an observatory and it was sacred. 
when we had these ancient people going to other places like North America and other continents, something that was sacred, that was vital to their existence and, and their belief system, they would build those in other places. And could perhaps these sacred sites be connected or, or connect these people across the continents? I, th I think you're absolutely right. I think these sites are, are sacred in that, in that way. And I, I think possibly people move, but also equally, maybe just people are so similar in wherever they live on the planet that they all observe the same sorts of things. Whether or not people actually move or don't move between these places, the fact that you have similar sorts of sites all over the planet, all respecting the heavenly bodies and, and so on, I think it's just a really nice thing. Yeah, that's, that's something about humanity and being human. Well, I think the one thing that we can definitely agree on, if nothing else, places like Stonehenge and America's Stonehenge prove how important tracking the celestial bodies were to these ancient people. The Phoenicians couldn't have built Stonehenge, but the site still might have been a sacred sanctuary for them. I think the fact that this place directly aligns with America's Stonehenge on the summer solstice is no mistake. Archaeoastronomy links many cultures together, like the Mayans in Georgia and the Celts in Oklahoma. And I think it's also what links the Phoenicians to our very own Stonehenge, proof of which I'm about to see with my own eyes. They could be the ones who marked an important day, the summer solstice, with a standing stone at the site over which the sunrise takes place. Hey guys. Good morning, Scott. Hi, Dennis. Hi, morning. Kelsey. How you doing? Good, how are you? Good. Good. How did the trip go? I had a great trip. I've got some really good stuff to share with you, but uh, I'm excited to see that alignment. So, sun's coming up. Should we head out? Yes, I'm ready. Let's go. We're about to see the sun rise over the solstice stone. To see the alignment Kelsey Stone discovered that links this site to Stonehenge in England. If you were to draw a line directly through the sun as it rises over the stone, it would run right through the center trilithon at Stonehenge and then continue on to Lebanon, once the center of the Phoenician Empire. To me, it's proof of an advanced understanding of archaeoastronomy and of an ancient connection to the United States. What else can you say but, wow, that's amazing. It never gets old. Tell you what, what we're seeing here is an amazingly accurate astronomical calendar. There's no accident. I saw the exact same thing at Stonehenge. They used standing stones just like this uh, to track the seasons. They used it for worship. I think they also used it for navigation, to come to the New World amongst other places. Ooh. Uh, it was absolutely amazing. The beginning of Stonehenge predates your site here. Um, the later stages do correspond, especially with the stone erecting period, so there might be a connection there. The, uh, the Phoenician connection is a little bit tenuous because uh, this actually predates the Phoenicians by a little bit. Maybe it was a proto-Phoenician group, we're not sure. You know what's great is you've got a sacred site in England, You've got a sacred site here, and there's no doubt that they're connected. Whether it was the Phoenicians or not, what it tells us is that some highly sophisticated culture, probably the elite in that culture, came over here and established this incredible site. And it's sites like this that connect the new world to the old world. The Stone family wanted to know if the Phoenicians made their site. It's a question the family has been trying to answer since Bob Stone bought this mysterious site back in 1955. While I can't say for sure the Phoenicians made it there, 
I believe they could easily have made it to the Americas. Somebody had to assemble those huge stones. Someone with a vast knowledge of archaeoastronomy. I believe archaeoastronomy is what links together many advanced civilizations and is what links some of them to America. I believe there was contact between ancient cultures. It may be why America's Stonehenge was built where it was, to create a place in the New World that lined up with a sacred site in the Old World. People were connected and were just starting to find out how. history that we were all taught growing up is wrong. My name is Scott Walter, and I'm a forensic geologist. There's a hidden history in this country that nobody knows about. There are pyramids here, chambers, tombs, inscriptions. They're all over this country. We're going to investigate these artifacts and sites, and we're going to get to the truth. Sometimes history isn't what we've been told. A lot of people have called me a modern-day Indiana Jones because I investigate artifacts, myths, and mysteries here in the United States and beyond. I don't know about that, but like him, I'm on a quest to find one of history's most sought-after and powerful artifacts, the Ark of the Covenant. And the clues I've collected make me think that it could be right here in America. The Bible says the Ark of the Covenant is the wooden chest that stores the Ten Commandments that God handed down to Moses. It's also said to hold immense power. Legend says that if you disrespect it, God may strike you down dead on the spot. It disappeared from religious records around 597 BC. Treasure hunters have been looking for it ever since, but I think they've been looking in all the wrong places. Based on tips and my own research, I've come up with four sites I need to investigate that could prove the Ark of the Covenant is in the United States. There's a mysterious hill site called the Hill of Tara in Ireland where the Ark was last seen. There's a farm in Virginia 
where a man has an artifact he says came to America with the ark. There's a museum in Ohio with a stone inscribed with the Ten Commandments, exactly what the ark is said to contain. And there's a carving in Arizona's petrified forest that looks a hell of a lot like the ark that I need to examine in person. I don't know how all these places fit together, but I think they could be part of a trail that will lead me to the Ark and solve one of history's greatest archeological whodunits. I think the best place to start is the last spot the Ark was reportedly seen. Well, Murray, I'm searching for the Ark of the Covenant, and I just came here from the United States. So some people believe that the Ark of the Covenant was, was here at one time? Uh, they do, yes. Some people believe that the Ark of the Covenant was buried on the hill of Tara. Um, this site is a very ancient ritual and royal site. Its oldest monument dates back to 3,500 uh, BC, the seat of the High Kings of Ireland. Some people believed that uh, the King of Tara was also the King of the world. Has any archaeology been done here? Well, in 1899, a group came here to dig for the Ark of the Covenant. They believed that Tara was the resuscitated Jerusalem, and they believed if they recovered the Ark of the Covenant, it would prove their theories. They thought that an Egyptian princess came over in the 6th century BC and brought the Ark of the Covenant with her. And they thought that she was buried here with the Ark of the Covenant. The name of the princess said to be in possession of the Ark was Tia Tefi, daughter of an Egyptian pharaoh. Tefi allegedly traveled here with the biblical prophet Jeremiah. The story of her escape to Ireland after the sacking of Jerusalem by the Babylonians is recorded in an 11th century Irish poem. As the legend goes, she married a king of Tara who entombed her body with the Ark after her death. That's what the group that dug here in 1899 was hoping to find. Where did they dig and what did they find? They dug the mound known as the King's Chair because they thought that she was buried in a royal site. Okay, so the King's Chair is um, a stone it's throne, a, perhaps, right? It's, it's a mound. It's a mound, okay. Yeah. Just let me show you um, this uh, book. See them digging here. They didn't follow rigorous scientific methodology. Okay. Now, it was also said that they found a golden bracelet which they threw away into the River Boyne mm. simply because it was not the Ark of the Covenant. They did not find uh, the Ark of the Covenant. Nobody knows where that is. And what do you think? What do I think? Um, I have uh, read and researched um, so many stories about the Ark of the Covenant. It's very difficult to unravel fact from fiction. Well, the Ark of the Covenant was not found here. So maybe it could have come to America. Um, I have come across stories which talk about pilgrims bringing various artifacts to the New World without okay. mentioning what they were. And that's where I'm going next. Maybe I can find some evidence there that will help us figure out once and for all if the Ark of the Covenant made it to America or not. The next stop in my investigation into whether the Ark of the Covenant is in America is Virginia. A man there named Jack Andrews says he has an artifact that came to America with the Ark. It's called the Stone of Destiny. Like the Ark of the Covenant, the legendary Stone of Destiny is another biblical artifact gone missing. It's said to be another name for the stone that Jacob in the Bible rested his head on when he had a vision of a stairway to heaven. 
And legend says the Ark of the Covenant and the Stone of Destiny were carried together. If this is truly the Stone of Destiny and it's here in America, then it's possible it could lead to the Ark itself. You must be Jack. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Yeah. Well, I'm excited to see your stone. Good. But first thing I would like to know is a little bit about the history, sure. the provenance. Right. Can you show me where you found it? Sure can. About 10 minutes from here. Well, Jack, this is a beautiful piece of property. How did you acquire this? Well, I bought it about four years ago. And then after we got into it, we discovered that it had this stone. The whole prospect of this stone that you found here possibly being connected to the Ark of the Covenant and maybe coming over to the US, that's amazing. This stone was given to the guy that bought this land in 1722 and put it in the spring right around the corner where we're going. And it was given to him as a wedding present by Jonathan Swift. So you're talking about Jonathan Swift of Gulliver's Travels? That's the same one. Well, according to Swift, it was the Stone of Destiny. Jonathan Swift is famous for writing Gulliver's Travels, but he was more than an author. Swift was born in Ireland in 1667 and was a cleric at St. Patrick's Church in Dublin, where it's possible he was privy to secret knowledge about sacred religious relics like the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, here is the spring where we found the stone. So what is this here? This is a replacement stone. The yeah. original <clears throat> stone was stolen by a group that brought a crane down the river and lifted it off and carried it away. And fortunately, one of the neighbors got a picture of the license tag. Oh, okay. Uh, and that's how we were able to track it down. So. They stole your stone, they you stole. got it back, and then they put a replacement stone here. Right. They actually left that here, we believe, at the time they took the original. I think they planned it. Like you wouldn't notice. Yeah. Why would they have taken it in the first place? I mean, it's been here for 300 years. What did they want with it? They claimed they were building a, the prophesized new city of Jerusalem, and they were going to build a temple to house the stone. And they wanted to have the stone of destiny, right? Oh, yeah. Well, I can see the water. It's an active spring. It's flowing pretty good right here into the creek. Obviously, it snows here. You get freezing and thawing. Oh, yeah. Pretty aggressive weathering environment here, so I would expect to see something reflected on the stone, depending on the rock type, of course. This Jonathan Swift, he was a pretty creative writer. How do we know that this isn't something that he dreamed up? Well, um, that's a possibility. On the other hand, he was closely affiliated with the church, might have had access to some artifacts, and I tell you what, if this stone that he was involved in that eventually made its way over here and originally came from Israel is the same stone, I mean, that's amazing. Right. Well, Jack, the only way I'm gonna be able to separate truth from fiction is to examine that stone. It's in my barn waiting for you. Let's go. Here's the stone. The Stone of Destiny. So the theory is that the Stone of Destiny came from Israel and was carried to Ireland, allegedly with the Ark of the Covenant. I know people search for the Ark at a site there called the Hill of Tara and couldn't find it. That's led to the theory that the Ark was secretly taken to America, along with the Stone of Destiny. Well, a couple things jump out at me right away. First of all, it's weathered, extensively weathered. And based on what we saw out in the field, the site that you said it had resided for, what, about 300 years? Yeah, yeah. Well, it looks like it's been weathering for perhaps that long, and it's in tough shape. The second thing is, this rock type here, it looks like a sandstone to me, mm -hmm. and I saw nothing like this 
on site on no. your other piece of property. So the rock type, the geology is totally different. The question is, could this be the stone of destiny that originally was created from rock from Israel? And if the legend is true, did the Ark of the Covenant come over to what is now North America with it? Right. And I guess that's the task in front of us. Maybe it is the first clue that would lead us to the Ark of the Covenant. The rock I'm about to study could be a sacred religious relic known as the Stone of Destiny and a clue that the Ark of the Covenant is here in America. Supposedly, this stone and the Ark were taken from Israel and brought to the hill of Tara in Ireland by a princess named Tia Tefi. From there, the stone is said to have made its way to America thanks to notable author Jonathan Swift. And maybe the Ark did too. If the geology of Jack Andrew stone is a match to stone in Israel, it could be an important first step in proving both the artifact's authenticity and Jack's claims it was brought here to the United States with the Ark of the Covenant. If it is authentic, it only begs more questions, like how is it separated from the Ark and where is the Ark now? Okay, Jack, we have your stone here that you think originated in Israel and made its way to Ireland along with the Ark of the Covenant, right? right. Where Jonathan Swift gave the stone as a wedding gift and ultimately he brought it here to what is now your land. That's correct. Okay, well, we have a really good sample here and with the 3D microscope, I'm gonna take a look at this and I'm gonna see if I can see anything here that tells me that it may have come from the Middle East. Go to it. Okay, so you see all these grains here? Yep. I'm seeing different colors or different intensities Great. of tan and gray. Mm -hmm. And so that tells me there's different minerals. Now I wanna zoom in a little tighter so I can see some of these individual grains. Wow. Now if you look at some of these grains, do you see how they have sharp edges? Yep. Those might be uh, micas possibly. But mm -hmm. see all this pore space in here, this open space? Right. Well, that's a pretty important thing very telling. That tells me this could have come from a desert environment, possibly from Israel. Agreed. It's clearly in a place that it doesn't belong. In other words, it didn't come from that area. Right. So what's interesting about that is whoever put it there went to a lot of effort. This thing probably weighs at least a thousand pounds. Yes, yes. They brought it from somewhere else, right. not from here, possibly from what is now Israel. This is a great beginning here. It tells me a lot. But the way I'm going to be able to absolutely identify these minerals is I have to cut this thing into a thin section. I see. And look at it with a different microscope called a polarized light microscope. Okay. The final test will tell us exactly what its composition is. Okay. I brought a Dremel tool along with me to cut a piece off. Then we're going to make... Are you okay with that? Yeah. There's no doubt cutting a sample from this rock is controversial. Desecrating a religious artifact is said to bring powerful, even deadly consequences. The small piece of stone Jack had won't work for my analysis. I need to collect my own sample to put under my microscope back home. No one, including me, wants to damage what could be a sacred artifact. But sometimes it's the only way to get answers. And here, it's essential to have the right kind of sample to compare with rock from Israel. Perfect. What's gonna be key in this whole thing is getting a sample from where you think that source rock was in Israel. Okay. If this stone did come from Israel, I mean, that's an amazing journey that it's been on. Do you have any other evidence that supports that? We have the book of Tia Tefi, her autobiography, 
and she was with the prophet Jeremiah. They reportedly brought this with the Ark of the Covenant to the hill of Tara, where they placed it and it became the throne of Ireland for a thousand years. So it's believed that this stone started its journey in Israel. Then it disappeared from the history books. How did Jonathan Swift get involved? Well, Jonathan Swift was brought up uh, at the hill of Tara and uh, became a minister. We've documented that. The legend says in 1700, he gave the stone as a wedding gift. Jack, I'm gonna study this stone and we're gonna get to the truth. And if this stone is part of the collection that includes the Ark of the Covenant, it just might lead to the artifact itself. The Ark of the Covenant is one of history's most sought after objects. It's said to hold the Ten Commandments that God inscribed in stone and handed down to Moses on Mount Sinai. According to scripture, disrespecting the Ark can bring deadly consequences. Once housed and venerated at King Solomon's temple in Jerusalem, it vanished around the time the Babylonians invaded the temple toward the end of the sixth century BC. That's when priests and disciples presumably carried it out of Israel in search of a new holy resting place. Built of acacia wood and plated with gold, the Bible says it was two and a half cubits in length, one and a half cubits in height, and one and a half cubits in breadth. That's nearly four feet long, two feet high, and two feet deep in modern measurements. Cherubim, or angels, were believed to adorn the top. I finished investigating the Ark's connection to the Hill of Tara in Ireland, the last place the Ark was allegedly seen. I've also met Jack Andrews, who thinks he has another religious relic called the Stone of Destiny that traveled to America with the Ark, but it's something I need to do more testing on to authenticate. Jack thinks Jonathan Swift, the author, sent the stone here to the US in the 1700s, and that maybe he sent the Ark too. While I wait for a sample of Israeli stone to compare with Jack's stone, I need to investigate an alternate theory of how the Ark came to America. After the Ark vanished from records in the sixth century BC, many people wonder if an ancient group of Hebrew people called the Lost Tribes of Israel found it and then brought it to America as the centerpiece for a new Jerusalem. Clues were allegedly left behind documenting this journey. I wonder if a carving in Arizona and stone I'm about to see in Ohio are two of these clues. Hey, Scott, good to see you. Good to see you. What brings you to Coshocton? Well, I'm investigating the possibility that the Ark of the Covenant may have come to North America. I was recently in Virginia where I talked to a man, Jack Andrews, who thinks the Stone of Destiny is on his property. He thinks it came from Israel uh, along with the Ark of the Covenant. One thing I can say for certain is that the geology of that stone does not match the local geology. And I'm pretty sure that there's a stone here that has a Hebrew connection, and I'm wondering if there might be some evidence that connects it with the Ark of the Covenant. And I know you know something about that stone. It's been a number of years uh, studying some artifacts I call archaeological outliers, and one of the most interesting is the, what's called the Newark Decalogue Stone. Mm -hmm. It was found uh, in 1860 near here in uh, south of Newark, Ohio. Well, the um, inscription on it is in Hebrew language. It has the abridged text from the Exodus version of the Ten Commandments. Well, there you go. The Ark of the Covenant is rumored to contain the two tablets with the Ten Commandments on them. Could this possibly be connected to the Lost Tribes and, and the Ark of the Covenant? Like the Ark of the Covenant, the Lost Tribes also went missing from history. The tribes lived in Israel until the Assyrians conquered in 722 BC. 
many people around the world claim to be their descendants, even here in the United States. Some think it's the Lost Tribes, not Jonathan Swift, who brought the Ark of the Covenant to America and left clues behind, like breadcrumbs along the trail they traveled. Could the Decalogue stone be one of those crumbs? My understanding is these uh, pretty controversial artifacts here. Yeah, there's they? a lot of controversy surrounding them, but uh, we could take a look at them and see what we think. Let's do it. This is the Decalogue stone with the Ten Commandments written on it on all sides of it. And this is a stone box that the Decalogue was found in. Okay. So when it was found, it was enclosed in this box and you couldn't even see the stone mm. inside. The box is carved out inside exactly to fit the Decalogue stone. Well, who's that guy? Well, this figure here on the front that's wearing a robe and a turban and holding either tablets or a breastplate. And over his head, in these Hebrew letters, it says Moshe or Moses. Oh. So that must be Moses. OK, that's Moses. All who, right. Who delivered the Ten Commandments. Ten uh, Commandments. So OK, well, we're, we're on the right path here. There's an open uh, slot here. Um, what was that used for? One suggestion that's been made is that that was to attach a leather strap for this to be used as an arm phylactery. So observant Jews uh, say prayers every day with a box containing scriptures bound to their arm with a leather strap. Well, Hugh, it seems to me that it appears to be an allegorical representation of the Ark of the Covenant that contains the Ten Commandments. So whoever it was that made this, if this is genuine, certainly embraced the Ten Commandments and the Ark of the Covenant. So if they were able to get over here to North America with this, maybe they brought the Ark too. Anything's possible. So what I would like to do is, is hopefully add uh, some more information, some more uh, data to the discussion mm -hmm. from a geologic standpoint. So if it's all right yeah. with you, I'd like to take a closer look. That'd be great. Wh whoever brought this could have somehow had the Ark of the Covenant. My search for the Ark of the Covenant has taken me from the Hill of Tara in Ireland, where the Ark was reportedly last seen, to a farm in Virginia where a man claims to have a biblical artifact brought here with the Ark in the 1700s. But the clue I'm investigating now in Ohio could help prove the Ark came to America a heck of a lot earlier than that brought here by Hebrew people in search of a new promised land. I want to know if this stone, inscribed with the Ten Commandments, might have been kept inside the ark, or was it left behind as a clue that one of the Bible's most sacred artifacts is right here in the United States? It seems to pass the scrutiny of the skeptics as far as the, the Hebrew text in the language, so now I'd like to try to add some evidence to this whole discussion. This thing is polished after it was carved. It's scratched like I would expect well, it's been scratched up by being put in the box and taken out of the box uh, frequently. This little edge right here is a wear pattern right yeah. here. Is that right about where this ledge in the uh, box would be? Boy, it fits snug. So the box in itself it took an awful lot of work. I mean, if it, if it was really a forgery, you wouldn't go to all that much trouble to make a box for it, so. I think that speaks to its authenticity that someone really was, this was very important to someone. This is a lot of work and it's polished. It's got the detailing of the grooves. It wasn't made, as far as I can tell, from modern machinery. Geologically, I don't see any problems here that would make these things obvious hoaxes. 
based on these artifacts, there's no reason in the world to not believe that the Ark of the Covenant couldn't have come over here. Right, it's conceivable that uh, if these people somehow got a hold of the Ark of the Covenant, they could have brought it along with the Ten Commandments. So the skeptics have rejected this. Well, that's been a factor, but the, I mean, Hebrew is an odd thing to find here. The fact that it's odd doesn't mean that it's not genuine. What it boils down to is really, the problem with these artifacts is that the academics don't like them because they don't fit the paradigm. And unfortunately for them, you can't dismiss things simply because you don't like them. Right. And so the evidence to me seems clear. There's no reason not to accept these as genuine, legitimate artifacts. So I've heard the legends about the Ark of the Covenant and the Stone of Destiny in Ireland. I've also heard stories that the Stone of Destiny has come over here to North America and is in Virginia. And if it came over, they believe the Ark came as well. And now I've looked at these artifacts here. We have uh, a representation of the Ten Commandments that was carried over here by some early Hebrew group. They made something that was analogous to the Ark. So if they could have brought this over here with the Ten Commandments on this stone, mm -hmm. they could theoretically have brought the actual Ark I'm still trying to figure out how the Ark of the Covenant might have gotten to America if it's here at all. Two basic scenarios are on the table. It's possible that a princess named Tia Tefi brought the Ark of the Covenant and the Stone of Destiny, which both originated in Israel, to the Hill of Tara in Ireland. There, author Jonathan Swift got a hold of them and secured their transport to America. But it's also possible the lost tribes or another early Hebrew group first brought the Ark to Tara and then brought it to America, leaving clues like the Decalogue stone behind. One of the things that will help me decide which theory is more likely is whether or not Jack Andrew Stone is actually from Israel. If it is the real Stone of Destiny as he claims, it has to match stone from that region. And there's still one final clue a carving in Arizona that could change everything about my investigation. But before I check it out, I need to compare the sample I took from Jackstone with the sample I got from Israel here at my lab in Minneapolis to get to the truth about his stone. Hey, Scott. Let's see. This is the Stone of Destiny, right? That looks really good. Then this is the sample from Israel, right? Yes, it is. So what was all this for? There are a lot of people who believe that the Ark of the Covenant came ultimately to North America with the Stone of Destiny. The Stone of Destiny is a stone that Jacob in the Bible rested his head on while he dreamt about the stairway to heaven. Now, I recently met with a guy, Jack Andrews in Virginia, who has a stone that he claims is the Stone of Destiny on his property. And one of the things I can tell you absolutely is that this stone does not match any of the surrounding geology. So it didn't come from there. Jack says it came from Israel. That's why we prepared these samples. Uh -huh. So really, the moment of truth is now. We'll start with this one right here. Now, as you know, sandstones are very unique. So if these things are even remotely close, there's going to be a, a lot of people that are going to get excited about this possibility. So this is the Stone of Destiny. One of the things that I see right away is we have quartz, we have feldspars. It looks like maybe a little quartzite. The grains are angular, so this is a sand grain supported sandstone. Very unique. That's what I see also. You see that too? Yeah. Okay. I'm curious to see what the other one looks like. All right, well, let's take a look. I, I don't think a lot of people realize this is like a DNA fingerprint. There's so many unique properties to sandstones. All right. The sample from Israel. Take a look. 
I've seen enough to make a decision. The Ark of the Covenant is arguably the most sought-after treasure of all time. Designed by God and infused with his presence, it has the power to inspire the faithful and strike down the heathen. Its whereabouts have been a mystery for thousands of years, but I think it's just a matter of time till its location is revealed. A chosen few have always been in charge of protecting it. And what better hiding place for an old world treasure than a new world sanctuary here in America? Jack Andrews agrees and thinks this stone, the Stone of Destiny, can help prove the Ark is here. The Stone of Destiny is referred to in the Bible when Jacob placed his head on the Stone of Destiny and dreamt about the stairway to heaven. And that stone, along with the Ark of the Covenant, which originated in Israel, came to North America. So, and is this the Stone of Destiny? That's why we had the uh, sample from Israel sent here. Take a look. It's not a match. Mineralogy is totally different. The size of the grains is different. Uh, there's an awful lot of pore space here. I mean, they're not, they're not even it's close. It's a different texture completely. Really, it couldn't be more different. Where are we going to go from here? Well, at this point, I guess what we can conclude is one of a couple things. We clearly do not have a match of the sample from Israel with Jack Stone of Destiny in Virginia. That either means that this sample uh, was collected from an area that is not the source of this material in Israel, or the material didn't come from Israel. We can't answer that question. If they would have matched, that would have been pretty exciting. But unfortunately, looks like we've hit a dead end with this particular stone. But this investigation is not over. Take a look at this. What are these? Looks like a stone carving. It's a stone carving. This was sent to me by a gentleman who thinks that that could be the Ark of the Covenant right there. And I have to admit that it looks an awful lot like it. Many depictions of the Ark of the Covenant look just like this. These two uh, veils that look a lot like the two angels uh, commonly seen with their wings coming together on top of the Ark of the Covenant. And so, where is this? Arizona. That's where I'm going next. If the Ark of the Covenant is here in North America, I'm gonna find it. The Ark of the Covenant may be hidden in America, brought here centuries ago from ancient Israel. My investigation uncovered some problems with the theory that the Ark traveled here with the Stone of Destiny. So far, science can't prove the stone on Jack Andrews' property is the real Stone of Destiny. Now, I'm leaning toward the other theory I've been studying, that an ancient group of Hebrew people brought the Ark here and left clues along the way. Clues like the Decalogue Stone. I'm headed west to check out the final piece in my quest for the Ark, a mysterious stone carving in Arizona's petrified forest. The lead might be a long shot, but I can't ignore anything that could possibly turn up one of the Bible's most iconic relics.
So, Jim, you found these petroglyphs when you were on vacation, is that right? Yes, my wife and I came out here a few years ago and see the petroglyphs and the ruins. Okay. But this uh, petroglyph was nothing like I'd ever seen before. So, <laughs> what did you think it looked like? Well, it looks like a lot like the Ark of the Covenant. It matches the descriptions, but what's it doing here in the Arizona desert? And that's why I called you. I'd like to get some answers to find out what, why it's here. From your pictures that you sent, it does look like the Ark, and I've been tracking the Ark for a while now. If we could find it, it would be amazing, but I'm really anxious to see your carving. So what do you make of that? <laughs> that looks very interesting. I mean, the carving has a, a man here with a hat. Looks like he's got his arm touching this rectangular box that looks a lot like the Ark of the Covenant. Let me show you a couple of pictures of the Ark here. Well, here are your two squares and the rectangle. You have your two what look like angels. So how old do you think it is? Well, you know, we're in a desert environment here, so petroglyphs in, in such an arid climate like this, very little rainfall. So things that look relatively new are actually hundreds of years old, which is what I think is the case here. So who do you think may have carved it? Well, I think by association with all the Native American petroglyphs, I mean, right next to it, literally, probably Native American, probably the Pueblo, whose ruins are, you know, just a few yards away. So to me, that makes the most sense. And if they did this, and it is the Ark, then they had to have seen it. So that means somebody had to come through here. Maybe the Native Americans saw the Ark of the Covenant, and they carved this. And this is their closest rendition to it, which is pretty close. And to me, that makes the most sense. I've done a lot of research on petroglyphs and native carvings throughout the Southwest, and this is nothing like I've ever seen before. This does not match anything that's ever been found. I think it is a carving of the Ark of the Covenant. Well, I have to agree with you. And if you look around here, you'll see depictions of animals, humans, and hunting, and it's just more natural scenes and, and life within the native community. And this just doesn't fit that motif at all. This trail that I've been investigating on the Ark of the Covenant has basically moved from east to west. It started in Israel. I think the trail comes here to Arizona. And you know what, Jim? As I look around here, the geology really doesn't lend itself to a good hiding place. Where do you think they might have taken the Ark? I think it could be one of the caves in the Grand Canyon. Local natives have many stories and legends about ancient people coming to the Grand Canyon. Maybe they brought the Ark, who knows? Makes sense. I mean, the geology in the Grand Canyon lends itself to caves. We know there's many caves there. Uh, it's almost impossible to get to, and if they did come there, maybe that would be a good place to hide it. Jim, who's to say that the Ark of the Covenant does or doesn't exist? And if it does exist, who's to say that it isn't right here in the United States? The Ark of the Covenant is the most revered religious relic in all of history. And evidence that I've seen suggests that it could be here in the United States. My investigation involved four different sites that are all tied together by their connection to legends about the Ark. Whether Jonathan Swift, the Lost Tribes, other Hebrew people, or someone else entirely is responsible, I think it could be here in the US. I don't believe legends of the Ark in America are fiction. I've looked into clues that stretch from Ireland to the Arizona desert, suggesting to me that the Ark of the Covenant being here could be part of a real story, and that there are more clues still hidden waiting to be found. Many people believe that our history, just like the Ark, is sacred and shouldn't be touched. But I'm not afraid to scratch the surface to ask questions that demand an answer. And for mysteries like the Ark of the Covenant, I'm going to continue my search. So my main interest at the time was exploring the cave. I wanted to know what it was, how far it went. There are 
bronze weapons in there, swords, spears, shields, knives, many artifacts, something like 7,000. No two are exactly the same. It proves that many of the things that have been taught in elementary school, high school, and colleges is wrong. They were treasure hunters searching for that cave. So I decided to completely hide its location. Search all you want, you'll never find it. The history that we were all taught growing up is wrong. My name is Scott Walter, and I'm a forensic geologist. There's a hidden history in this country that nobody knows about. There are pyramids here, chambers, tombs, inscriptions. They're all over this country. We're gonna investigate these artifacts and sites, and we're gonna get to the truth. Sometimes history isn't what we've been told. Our country is filled with caves, caverns, and burial chambers that could hide artifacts and sacred wonders from long ago. I've looked for the Ark of the Covenant, the Holy Grail, and other things rumored to be hidden here. I think these things are just waiting to be found by those who search hard enough. Without a doubt, some of the greatest lost treasures of all time are those from ancient Egypt where vast burial chambers lie virtually empty, the pharaoh's riches having vanished. Many people believe these old world artifacts were brought to the new world, and I think they could be right. A few years ago, I examined some alleged Egyptian artifacts said to have been found in a cave in rural Illinois. But Illinois isn't the only place said to hide such treasures. That's why I'm heading to another place where many think ancient Egyptians once came with their vast riches, the Grand Canyon. Stretching 277 miles, the Grand Canyon is about 18 miles wide and up to 6,000 feet deep. It was carved out by the Colorado River about 500 million years ago and the layering of the rock reveals a huge amount of our nation's geological history. And there are caves here, but only a few of them have been explored. So if ancient Egyptians brought their treasure here, it's likely still hidden. And I'm meeting a guy who says he knows where it is. Jerry, thanks for meeting me here today in this amazing place. It is. It's very amazing. You know, there are many myths and stories about ancient cultures coming to America with fantastic treasures. Some people say that there's a treasure buried here somewhere in the Grand Canyon. And I have a newspaper article from the Phoenix Gazette in 1909 that talks about a treasure here. Let's take a look at this. Explorations in Grand Canyon Mysteries of immense, rich cavern being brought to light. Remarkable finds indicate ancient people migrated from the Orient. And that's amazing. Yeah, it is. And you know, the person who did this exploration was G.E. Kincaid. He'd been hired by the Smithsonian, and he went pretty much looking for this cave full of treasure and this lost city that's down there. Did he find it? And, and what happened after that? Kincaid knew what he was looking for. He pretty much went to the spot found a series of steps that went up the cliff wall, went into the cave. He found not only hieroglyphs, but he found all kinds of artifacts. Like what? Well, he was statuary. There were mummies in there. There were, indeed, pieces of uh, gold and silver. Now, one of the things they mention here is that this particular cave is virtually inaccessible. 
although it does talk about 1,400, 1,500 steps, sandstone steps that were carved into the rock that would allow them to, to get there. The other thing that's amazing to me is, according to the article, this cave is so massive that 50,000 people could have lived there. So potentially there could have been thousands, if not millions, of artifacts inside this cave. And the fact that we look around here and we see this geology, we know we've got sandstone, limestone, it's going to lend itself to caves. And I know that there's a lot of caves here. So, you know, that fits. But today, the Smithsonian's official position is that this whole story is a hoax. Is that correct? We contacted the Smithsonian. They deny that there's a cave, that there's any evidence, that there was anything here. So are you suggesting that the Smithsonian is covering up something here in the Grand Canyon? Oh, they absolutely are. Because I know that you've done a lot of work out here. You've made some expeditions here. What did you find? Well, we came here trying to find the truth. Kathy, my wife, did the research over a number of years and finally pinpointed a spot that we believe is exactly where this would need to be if it truly existed. So where is that location? You know, this is a really difficult place to get to, Scott. It isn't easy at all. But yeah, I can show you where we believe the cave is at. So you're up for it. I'd be happy to show you what we know. Well, Jerry, what makes you so sure that you know where this site is? Well, once we got to the site that Kathy had identified, we started looking very closely at anything that might have been left behind by the Smithsonian explorers and excavation team that had been there ahead of us. Mm -hmm. We found buttons, pieces of glassware, a name badge, uh, several small pieces that were 80 to 100 years old. So do you think this corresponds with the expedition back in 1909? Yeah, I do. Now, this, this place is very dangerous. Why do you say that? Well, it's dangerous because while we were there on several occasions, there were government stealth helicopters. Stealth helicopters? Seriously? They know it's there, Scott. And we know that they know it's there. So do you think they were trying to scare you off? I know they were trying to scare us off. Let me tell you this. If there's an ancient site somewhere down in the Grand Canyon, possibly Egyptian, they're not going to scare me off. Ancient Egypt is famous for its vast riches and immense wealth. When King Tut's tomb was discovered in 1922, his coffin alone was made from solid gold and was worth over $13 million. Much of the treasure attributed to Egyptian pharaohs has yet to be found. So what I want to know is, could it be here in America? If it was hidden away on US soil, some people think it's in the Grand Canyon. An old news article suggests Egyptian treasure was found here, and another treasure might be here too, the Ark of the Covenant. My search for the religious relic turned up clues nearby in Arizona's Petrified Forest National Park. If any treasure is here in the canyon, it's in an incredibly dangerous and inaccessible spot, possibly even guarded by the government. But the reward is too great, and I have to find out what's hidden here. There were things that were going on that just didn't make any sense for such a remote location. I want to find this thing wherever it is, and I need your help. This area where the cave is located is considered sacred ground by the Hopi, Navajo, Zuni, and other tribes of this area. Do you think that maybe they might have some information that could be helpful to us? Well, I know someone who might have some answers fill in the blanks. The Zuni tribe are Pueblo people who have made the Southwest their home for hundreds of years. To the Zuni, the Grand Canyon is a holy place, their creation story telling how the ancestors climbed up from its basin. Even today, Zuni men still make pilgrimages to the Grand Canyon to venerate this sacred site. Clifford, as a Zuni tribal elder, 
What can you tell me about the Grand Canyon, what it means to your people? Well, the Grand Canyon, to the Zuni people and other Pueblo tribes, this is considered our <clears throat> place of origin, not only in terms of religion, but also spirituality, about where our forefathers and our ancient ones came out of. Is there anything in your creation stories um, that talks about some of these mysterious caves, maybe even the one that could possibly hold Egyptian artifacts. In our spiritual teachings, there are actually rooms inside the Grand Canyon, and there's several passageways. Right. So that parallels with some of the history about the early 1900s, and also about some of the, the treasures that a lot of Indian tribes talked about. Are there any stories about what might be in some of these caves? Uh, I've heard a lot of uh, different uh, stories from different tribes that talk about these treasures that are supposedly in there. But then also I heard about a pyramid that's supposedly inside the Grand Canyon. A pyramid? A pyramid. So Clifford, your oral stories say that there were cities inside of these caves and pyramids in the Grand Canyon. I absolutely believe in that because there's been a lot of different uh, crossing of different cultures this part of the world. It's my understanding that there was a lot of Egyptian type uh, relics and um, artifacts that were taken from the, inside the Grand Canyon. Are there any stories about any of these caves being cursed? In most uh, Native American sites, there are natural occurrences that might be considered cursed. It's sort of like a guardian type mm -hmm. uh, thing, and it's still even in existence to this day. You have to tread very carefully. Absolutely. So do you think there still could be treasure down there? Oh, absolutely. This is a huge place. <laughs> and if you look at the rooms and the, the space inside the canyon itself, there's a lot of artifacts of past civilizations. I believe in that, that there's a lot of treasure still inside the canyon. Do you think we can get there? Well, you might try getting there, but it's very dangerous. Well, you know, I appreciate what uh, Clifford was saying, but I'm not ready to give up yet. We have to figure out a way to get into that cave. Well, it's a very dangerous place. Clifford was right. I have some video to show you of our 2002 expedition into the canyon. It'll show you exactly how dangerous a place this is. Sounds good. Let's take a look. This is our camp from our 2002 expedition when we were at the Grand Canyon trying to find a way down to the area where Kincaid's cave would be found. It looks like it drops right off, right? Beyond this point is just a sheer 2,000 foot drop off. People standing here on the edge of the canyon, past that point, it is straight down maybe 2,000 feet. It's just what I'm seeing here does look, I mean, that's, that's a pretty steep slope. It, it's absolutely dangerous, absolutely dangerous. And here you see, now they've gone over the edge, they're hanging off the ropes, they've gone down maybe 800 feet, and and this one fellow is just hanging off the rope. They're suffering heat exhaustion. There's no way you can carry enough water to get to this place. So basically what you're saying is to get to this cave, I mean, it's virtually impossible. It is. All right, what you're looking at here is uh, while our team was going down, descending into the canyon over these cliffs, you can see very clearly. Holy crap. There's this unmarked plane that's flying well below the canyon rim. Uh, rim. As you see it going right through there. We've also seen helicopters, and they've buzzed us at various times we've been there. They don't, they don't have any markings either, and we feel they must be government helicopters, government airplanes. They were watching us. Or maybe they were trying to scare you off. Probably trying to. So they never did get down to the cave entrance? They never did. Yeah, it, it proved to be way too difficult. Heat exhaustion took over, and it was really very difficult to get them back to the surface. Do you think that we could climb down here realistically? No. I mean, how long would that take? What are we talking about time-wise? You need expert mountaineers and a lot of rope. 
Well, you know what? There might be another way to get there. All right. What do you have in mind? Explorer 9 Canyon ground, wind 1806, left turn eastbound, approved, runway 21, clear for takeoff. And Candy, Copter 49, boost ready. Copter 49, Candy Tower, please go to southeast. Copter 49, let's go for a southeast departure. exactly where you need me to go. Yeah, yeah, it's just right down there below that ridge. So I'm going to do an orbit. I'm going to lose a little bit of altitude here okay. and do an orbit over the location. Okay, boy, it says Nankway 519, climbing 95. And Eagle 49 is over the little Colorado River. Right there. We need to descend down below that ridge line in order to see directly across into the canyon. I can't do that. The FAA has restricted all flight below the canyon rim not allowed to descend down there. So you're telling me that the FAA, the government, will not allow us to go down there? Absolutely not. down below that ridge line in order to see directly across. The FAA has restricted all flight below the canyon rim, not allowed to descend down there. So you're saying that the government will not allow us to fly over this area right here? This is where the Egyptian cave is supposed to be? No, sir. We're not allowed down there. That's the level that we think that the cave is at, right there. Okay just beyond that next drop off. That next, exactly. So Jerry, we are pretty much above it, on top of it, you think? Yeah, there's the uh, circle of rocks from our campsite. Is there any way that we could get down on that plateau just above it? Could you, could you land there? We can land on the top. I can get you on that plateau right over there. Okay, well that would, I guess that's the next best thing. Well, I'm gonna go ahead and just land right down there. Okay, 978 Eagle 49 is uh, landing. I'll call you back up in the air. So Jerry, this was your base camp right here, right? This is where you started your operation to get down to what you hoped was the Egyptian cave? This is it. When we were here before, the guys that were going over, we thought they were prepared. We really didn't know what it would take at the time. And they went down about 800 feet, and they ended up getting stuck. 800 feet, that's only about what, halfway down to where you think the cave is? It's about halfway, yeah. Going over the side, it just seems impossible. You can't see the cave from the bottom, nor can you see it from the top. It's at an in-between level, it's completely obscured. That newspaper article is very compelling from 1909. Something happened here in the Grand Canyon. I think the government is hiding something. The fact that a plane flew by when you guys were down here repelling tells me that they had to have been watching you. They're guarding something. 
The oral stories of the Zuni and other tribes uh, around the Grand Canyon clearly suggest that some people came here, that there are many caves here, but there may be caves that housed ancient cultures and maybe artifacts, possibly the Egyptians. So I'm convinced that there is something here. Well, we've only scratched the surface, and we're sure that there were ancient cultures who came through here. It could have been the Egyptians. We think it was someone from the Orient. There's some talk that even the Ark of the Covenant might have come through here. You know, I recently was in the petrified forest, and I saw a petroglyph that looked just like the Ark of the Covenant. So maybe the Ark of the Covenant did come to North America through the petrified forest. Maybe it's down there in that cave. After taking a good look around, it's clear that further exploration is impossible. It frustrates me not to reach this cave, but it isn't the only cave in America rumored to hide Egyptian treasure. There's another cave in Southern Illinois, and while I've studied artifacts allegedly taken from it, I've never seen the cave itself. I met the man who claims he found this cave, Russell Burroughs and I even got his story on camera. They were people searching for that cave, treasure hunters. So I had decided that the best thing to do is to completely hide its location, which I did. Now he won't talk to me at all, but maybe it's time to go look for the cave and see once and for all if Russell was telling the truth. You know, speaking of treasures, there's another cave in Southern Illinois, Burroughs Cave, I'm sure you've heard of it. We have. I've actually spent quite a bit of time looking at the artifacts, but I've never found the cave, and that's where I'm headed next. I want to find Burroughs Cave. If I can find Burroughs Cave, it would be a huge step toward proving Egyptian treasure really did make it to America. And that's why I need to visit someone who may know just how to find it. Harry Hubbard, an artifact collector and researcher who's devoted his life to studying the Illinois Treasure Cave. Harry has some examples of the treasures that he's eager for me to see. This is amazing. It looks like the greatest hoard of treasure I've ever seen in person. But they're not gold. These are made of lead, right? That's correct. These are replicas of original gold pieces brought out in 1985. What happened to all the gold? Where is it? These are replicas. Right. Well, Burroughs melted the gold and then sold it off. Oh, really? Yes. OK. You know, I'm seeing Egyptian iconography. I'm seeing some interesting text, a sun god symbol. To see all this stuff that you have here and to think that it was actual gold treasure at one time is amazing. I mean, it's got to be one of the greatest hoards in history. The original pieces came from here in Marion County. OK. There's an ancient tomb very nearby. OK. The cave, right? The cave. All right. Tell me about the cave. The original description indicated that there were 13 crypts. OK. The main crypt had a king and a solid gold sarcophagus. And there was one crypt that actually had a woman in it. Hmm. And the rest were ancient kings. 13 cadavers buried in one crypt. So you're convinced that, that the gold that came out was real? Oh, yes, most definitely. Well, let's get back to Russell Burroughs. Okay. He's the guy that told me fantastic stories about pulling out uh, not just gold artifacts, but uh, artifacts uh, carved and made out of stone. I've talked to him about these artifacts. And did you study those artifacts? Absolutely, I did. What did you determine? Well, I can tell you with absolute certainty that I think I know what's behind this notorious mystery of the Illinois cave and how it might connect with the Grand Canyon cave that I just looked at. I'm on the hunt for Egyptian treasure that legends say is buried somewhere in America. The big question is, where is it? 
I've checked out a prohibited area at the Grand Canyon in Arizona. And now I'm examining replicas of possible Egyptian artifacts found in another cavernous hiding place here in southern Illinois. Legend says the original gold and the other carved pieces were taken from a cave here in the 1980s. But whether this is a true story or a tall tale remains to be seen. I've spent years trying to get to the truth myself. In 2010, I managed to get the only interview of Russell Burroughs ever known to be filmed, and I examined some of the artifacts he claimed he found. The varied collection ranged from a shaman and a cartouche carved in black marble to a white marble stone with the Greek goddess Isis on it. But after I questioned their authenticity, Russell refused to speak with me again. The key to the mysterious cave in Illinois here really centers on Russell Burroughs. I mean, he's the one that made the cave famous. That's why they call it Burroughs Cave. Uh, he is the reason that a lot of people have become skeptical of the artifacts, because a lot of them have been tainted and forged. You know, I felt it was important to give Russell an opportunity to say something about it, so I interviewed him back in 2010. I'd like to see what he's got to say. Well, in 1982, uh, I was uh, out working with my metal detector searching for an old homestead. I was walking down the, the trail on the bluff and I uh, stepped on a rock which uh, dropped me into a pit or a hole. And lo and behold, behind it was a cave. There are bronze weapons in there, swords, spears, shields, knives. Many artifacts, many, many, something like 7,000. No two are exactly the same. Well, that's quite a story, isn't it? This one is different from the rest of them. Oh, really? Yes. The story changes quite frequently. Well, one of the things that does jump out at me is his descriptions of what he sees in the cave are incredibly detailed. Well, Burroughs describes 13 crypts. The main crypt is a man in a solid gold sarcophagus. Do you I, think... belie I believe he saw those things. Well, I have an artifact I want to show you. That's the Isis stone, uh, an Egyptian-looking female who's kneeling in reverence to Ra, the sun god. And this is an artifact that, uh, if you look closer, um, is very revealing. You look right here. You can see that there are some carved characters here. Mm -hmm. This is English cursive writing. Mm -hmm. Why would English writing be on an ancient Egyptian artifact? That's problem number one. This particular stone is exactly two inches thick, as are most modern white marble tombstones used between about 1850 and 1950, mm -hmm. very commonly used at that time. But it gets more interesting after that. If you look at this kind of dark gray material, mm -hmm. That's actually modern mortar. Okay. The next thing that happened here is you see these chips on the backside? Right. Somebody chipped the backside, apparently to try to remove the inscriptions on the back and make it look old. So there's no question in my mind that this is a fake artifact and that it was made from a modern white marble tombstone. But that doesn't mean that the cave doesn't exist. In fact, That's it could true. very well exist and I have a couple of artifacts that I want to show you that Russell claims came from his cave. It looks like uh, perhaps it's an Egyptian shaman. It's got the Egyptian beard. It has a very creepy look to it, and it could very well be authentic. Who knows? This is another artifact that looks very interesting to me. Right. This is a cartouche, an Egyptian cartouche. Yes, it is. And in most cases, a cartouches carry the names of a pharaoh or somebody of importance. Well, these two are, are authentic. There's no doubt in my mind. There's not that many people that know Egyptian glyph, and the ones that are carved in Egyptian glyph, the uh, grammar, syntax, everything is pretty much correct. After looking at all these artifacts here, looking at all the replicas of the gold, imagining this vast mm -hmm. treasure underground, my question to you is, do you think the cave is real? I know the cave is real. And we know how all this came over here. Come on, let me show you something. OK.
This is the man who brought all the treasures over here from Egypt. Oh, really? Yes. And who is this? His name is Alexander Helios. He is the missing son of Cleopatra and Mark Anthony. Alexander Helios was an Egyptian prince whose famous parents, Antony and Cleopatra, committed suicide when a Roman emperor conquered Egypt. Alexander Helios, as the eldest son, may have feared for his life and fled the country with the family fortune. At the time, Egypt had many sailing ships, so perhaps Helios came to what's now America to seek refuge, bringing his treasure with him. All right, so why did he come over here? One of the stones clearly says, we left the Mediterranean to escape persecution. And he's all over these artifacts, probably on about 500 of them. And it tells his life story here. After about age 10, he vanishes off of the face of history. Okay. But here we have him as an older man, as a younger man, in different uh, costumes. He was a priest of the sun, and that was his name, Helios, which, which is Greek for the sun. OK. So you think he came here? Yes. And um, when was this? Probably about 25 BC. Well, that's very interesting. And how many people do you think came with him? According to the tablets, probably 50,000. 50,000 people. Well, that's pretty interesting, because when I was out at the uh, cave in the Grand Canyon, they talked about it being big enough to house 50,000 people. And maybe the cave that you have here, that you think is here, maybe those people also went out to the Grand Canyon. So what do you think of the theory that Alexander Helios came here to North America with all these treasures? Well, it's interesting for a couple of reasons. One is Helios and the people you talked about are real historic figures. And the fact is they did disappear from the pages of history. And they had to go somewhere. Why not here? So I like it from that standpoint. But I need to see more evidence before I'm convinced. I mean, mm -hmm. these are great, but I need to find that cave. Do you know where that cave is? Yes, we know where the cave is. All right, show me. Now, this map came from the file cabinet of one of Russell Burroughs' associates. I've been researching this for 20 years, and there's been a few things that I was wrong about here and there, but the location of this tomb is not one of them. OK. This is what we call the pinpoint map. All right, so this is his secret map, right? This is Russell Burroughs' <clears throat> secret map. And if you'll notice, there's a ravine system here. And right here, there's dots right here. And also, there's a red dot right here. OK. There's a cavern in one ravine and a large room underneath the ground of the other one. OK. And I'm going to put an X right there and right there. So X marks the spot. You got it. How far away is this uh, ravine system? About four and a half miles away. Well, Harry, if you're right, I've got to get out there and find this cave. You know, there's always truth in legend. We have to get to the truth, and that's what I'm going to find. Some people believe that ancient Egyptians may have come to America with their treasure. And now, I'm searching for these caves that may hide these amazing artifacts. I visited the Grand Canyon, where it's believed there were caverns of vast riches from afar. And here in Illinois, I've examined replicas of the many Egyptian artifacts that are said to have come from Burroughs Cave. When I saw them, I said to myself, where in the world are these from? Using the secret treasure map that Harry Hubbard gave me, I've tracked down the landowner of the area on the map. And although Harry wasn't allowed on the site, I've been given access. And if there's a cave here, I'm going to find it. I'm investigating the possibility of Egyptians bringing treasure to America. I was just out in the Grand Canyon, and I uh, investigated a mysterious cave that is uh, alleged to contain treasures. And now I'm here in southern Illinois investigating the Burroughs Cave Mystery, another Egyptian treasure uh, possibility here. What do you think about all this? I think it's a very fantastic legend. How could people from the Middle East have made it across the Atlantic up to Mississippi and have found this spot here out in the middle of nowhere? I can appreciate your skepticism, but there is an historical figure called Alexander Helios, who about 2,000 years ago did disappear from the pages of history. 
and he was uh, of Egyptian heritage. He did have ships, he did have a following, and the question is, where did he go? The other thing that is really interesting and compelling to me is that there are at least 7,000 artifacts that reportedly did come from Burroughs Cave. Uh, I've seen a couple thousand of them myself, and some of them are quite ornate and beautiful, and they had to come from somewhere. Those are two things that do intrigue me. But um, I want to hear more about what you have here. And this is supposed to be the area where the cave is. What do you know about it? Well, let me show you on uh, my aerial view here, my property here. Okay. Uh, we have the road to the north that we entered here, and we're parked right here at the edge of the, uh, the woods and this okay. open field. And there's supposedly two ravines where these uh, Egyptian tombs or caverns are, are supposed to be located. Okay. I do have a map here that I'd like to compare with your map. Okay. So <clears throat> here it should, looks like it's right here. So that would put us, these are the two ravines you're talking about right here. Correct. So apparently this is where Burroughs Cave is, is located. That's what most people believe, yes. Are you willing to take me in there? Yes, I am, Scott. Discovering Burroughs Cave here in Illinois would be the find of the century. But the questions surrounding the veracity of the artifacts discovery are a problem for most everyone, including me. I want to know, did Russell Burroughs really find and conceal this cave, or did it ever exist at all? His own accounts suggest it's off a trail near some bluffs, just like the bluffs on Stevens Land, so I think we're in the right area. Burroughs said he slipped into a pit that led him into a long treasure cave. My examination of the geology here will be key. If there's not a cave here, then I need to analyze the rock to see if there could be one underground. Well, Scott, this is the West Ravine. That is a natural rock shelter. Does it go under here, too? Yes, there's a ledge underneath where we're standing. Pretty impressive, actually. Can we get down there? I sure would like to look around here a little more. Yeah, there's a trail over here to our right that leads down into the ravine. The first thing I can say is the rock shelter in the ravine is not a cave, but a cave entrance discovered back in 1982 might have become hidden by a rockfall or overgrown by trees in the 30 years since Burroughs first found it. I'm not ready to give up on the idea ancient Egyptians might have come here and tunneled out deep into rock. But to find out if that's possible, I'll need to test the rock type. So, Scott, here we're at the spot that was marked as an X on your map, but I don't see any caverns or, or uh, chambers or anything. I see a lot of sandstone that's been naturally eroded by water right. over hundreds of years here. Well, you're right. And, you know, looking at the map, it was a very small-scale map, and that dot that was put on there, and it may be on the correct spot, it may not. You know, one of the things I'd like to get a sense of is how well compacted this sandstone is, how strong it is. Could they have tunneled through this following fractures and maybe taking advantage of natural, you know, openings in the rock? You know what I want to do is I want to see what is holding those sand grains together. You see anything, Scott? Yeah. Seeing sand grains that appear to have little or no cement. That's why this stuff is pretty soft. Uh-huh. Yeah, this piece is just crumbling in my hands. Right, right. There's one more test that I would like to do, though. What we have here is dilute hydrochloric acid. I want to see if there's any calcite cement, and if it's there, it'll fizz. So let's see. This looks like they're being absorbed into the rock. Yeah. It's soaking in quickly, which means there's little, if any, 
cement. It's an open space between okay. the sand grains. This rock, in fact, does lend itself to carving caves. You know, I've been to places where I would say absolutely not, uh -huh. but here I would say it's possible. So, Scott, what does it all mean? Well, what it means to me is could ancient cultures, conceivably from Egypt, have come here to your property and carved caves and put Egyptian treasure in them? Yes, I think they could have. Being a realist, I'm not sure that I believe that the Russell's Cave or the Mystery Tomb ever existed. Mm -hmm. And I think this thing's sort of been perpetuated by the fact that uh, Southern Illinois has the nickname as Little Egypt that's been around since the early 1800s. There's various things that have that word Egyptian in them, like uh, the local newspaper has uh, pyramids on it and the pictures of the Sphinx. And then as, as a coincidence, the town at the confluence of the Mississippi and Ohio is named Cairo. For anybody to have come over from the Middle East, made it all the way over here across the Atlantic and much less down in Illinois, it would be just uh, the most uh, fantastic voyage in the history of mankind. Well, you think it's geographically far-fetched that the Egyptians could have come here to the heartland of America, but I'm not ready to give up on that idea just yet. In fact, I firmly believe that there were many cultures that came here prior to Columbus, going back thousands of years. So it's certainly possible that the ancient Egyptians did come here to America. We just need to find more proof. There are incredible stories that ancient Egyptians somehow made their way to what is now the United States. But from all that I've seen, I think that behind these legends is an astounding truth. At the Grand Canyon, I heard from a descendant of some of Arizona's earliest inhabitants about encounters with ancient travelers from the east. It's a story echoed by the earliest European explorers who found clues to an Egyptian voyage that I think the government may be covering up. I saw an amazing account of a Smithsonian expedition to uncover a wealth of Egyptian treasures hidden in a cave large enough for 50,000 men. Maybe the 50,000 men whom some believe were led here by the son of Antony and Cleopatra. I think the Illinois Treasure Cave and the cave in the Grand Canyon could very possibly be real. The geology proves beyond a doubt that ancient people could have carved hiding places for their vast treasures in both locations. This great land we know as America has many natural treasures, and I'm absolutely convinced that it's been drawing people here for thousands of years.